Okay, so tonight we're going to start uh, pharmacology. We should be able to get through this tonight, and we should have a few minutes at the end if anybody has any questions on anything they want to review. So pharmacology, or the ability to administer medications, is really what uh, differentiates EMTs from somebody who takes like a first aid class or you know, any kind of emergency training, because, you know, if you take a first aid class, you're not really allowed to administer medications, but uh, an EMT um, is in certain circumstances that we're going to talk about tonight. And the amount of medications that an EMT can administer has actually been increasing every year. So they're adding more and more to what EMTs are able to do, which is obviously a good thing. Okay, so we'll talk about that. Okay, so Medication names. I think the other night somebody asked me, you know, is Ventolin the same as Albuterol? Is the same as, uh, you know, some other different names and stuff like that. So when they name a medication, just hold one second. I just want to get everybody included in the class. Why is the mouse not? Okay. Okay. So when they, when they develop a drug, obviously a, a drug company spends a lot of money with research and testing and everything like that. And they get a patent on the medication, which gives them exclusive rights to sell the medication for a certain amount of years. I forgot how many years it is, but uh, you know, it's, it's probably seven to 10 years. So they're the exclusive seller of the medication to recoup back the cost of you know making the medication. So they get to pick a name, but there's many different names to a drug. So the chemical name is the name given by the scientists who developed it and it's a very long, complicated name, okay? The generic name is usually the name, the easy to remember name um, of the medication, hold on, okay? Um, that's kind of based on the chemical name. And then the brand name is what the company has decided would be a catchy name, okay, to, um, you know, uh, add to it. So brand name, trade name, all the same things, right? So that's kind of what we see, like, you know, Tylenol is acetaminophen, okay, but the the uh, the trade name is Tylenol, right? So here we have the generic name is albuterol, right? We would never want to have to pronounce the chemical name because it's very, very long, okay? And the initial companies that um, first developed it named it Preventil and Ventil, right? But that doesn't mean now, because it's off patent, that people cannot sell it, you know, and just call it albuterol. So they get the the um, the ingredients and they make the drug. They're not allowed to call it Preventil or Ventolin because these are trademark names, but they can call it albuterol. So when you go to Costco and you're buying Tonal, you're not actually buying name brand Tonal. I guess they might actually sell it, but you're, most of us would be buying the generic version of it, which just says uh, acetaminophen like Tonal, similar to Tonal, something like that. Same thing like ibuprofen is the generic name but you could buy the more expensive versions, which are Motrin, Advil, and Mitel. Same exact drug, should be working same exact way, but you know they get to charge a little more because it's a, it's a known name, you know, it's a marketing thing, okay? So, so on and so on, like with Viagra and everything like that, okay? Now, when we're administering medications, the things that we absolutely have to know is what they call an indication. So an indication is a reason why we'd be giving the medication. And a contraindication would be a reason why we wouldn't give the medication. In other words, it would be uh, somebody has allergies to aspirin. That would be a contraindication. Somebody's having chest pain that you think is a heart attack. That would be an indication. Okay. Side effects are what could go wrong when you're administering a medication. Okay. Now, some of them are routine, normal side effects, like somebody getting a headache if you give them nitroglycerin. And like somebody passing out because you drop their blood pressure when you give them nitroglycerin would be a, what they call an untoward effect. I mean, in other words, it's, it's a possible side effect, okay? But it's not something we would wanna see. So it's kind of a, a, a bad side effect to it. Okay. So again, we have to know for all the medications, the indications, the contraindications, any possible side effects that can occur, and all untoward effects are like bad side effects, like dangerous side effects. Like somebody getting a headache would be a normal side effect of nitroglycerin. Somebody getting a little nervous and jittery would be a normal side effect of albuterol. But somebody passing out because you dropped their blood pressure because you vasodilated them when you give them nitroglycerin, that would be an untoward effect. Okay. Okay, so medications come in very different forms. They're not gonna ask you all the different forms, but just as an example, oxygen is a gas, so we administer oxygen. 
sublingual medications is nitroglycerin, okay? Most of the medications we administer are in liquid form, right? So we don't really get into gels and suspensions and powders and, you know, maybe aspirin being a tablet or a powder, um, compressed powder or um, tablet would be another one, okay? Looks like we're almost have everybody in class, so we'll stop getting interrupted in a second. Okay. What suspensions? Suspensions are, well, you might've made that. If you get medications that are in a powder form and then you have to mix them in a liquid and stir them up. So sometimes you'll get antibiotics and they'll mix up the first batch for you. But then they say, okay, when you're finished seven days into, when you're finished with the first batch of the antibiotic, then you mix up the second one. So there's certain antibiotics that come that way. And the reason they don't mix it all up for you is it decreases its shelf life, right? So they want to leave it in a powder form. It's much more stable until you're ready to use it. So that's all. So you just have to, they give you the bottle, the bottle has the water in it, and then you just have to add the powder to the water or the antibiotic medication to the sterile water, and then you're ready to go. Now, to be able to administer medications, it's one of two things. Most of the times we give medications, it's on what they call standing order, right? Which means that we're not actually asking the doctor. It's a written guideline called our protocols. And part of our protocols are what they call standing orders, which means that there are things we could do without speaking to the doctor. Okay. Then there's other parts that are called medical control options, like giving epinephrine to somebody having an asthma attack. So giving epinephrine to somebody having an allergic reaction would be a standing order. But giving epinephrine to somebody having an allergic reaction, if you remember we were talking the other night, we said that's kind of a last ditch effort in somebody who's dying. So that would require, since it's so rare to do it, that would require permission from the doctor to be able to do it. Okay. So when we have to call that's called calling medical control, or in the book, they call it medical directions. You're speaking directly to the physician, a nurse practitioner, or, or physician assistant. They have to be the emergency room uh, physician, nurse practitioner, or physician assistant that is supposed to know our protocols. I'll be honest with you, they don't, but they're supposed to know our protocols, and they're supposed to be able to help us and give us guidance, okay? Now, when you, if they give you an order for, I don't know, you know, with you guys, it's pretty standard doses, but what they always say is that when you get an order, you're supposed to repeat it back to them so that it's clear that you understood the order is no mistake, okay? And if they ask you to do something that sounds a little left of center, then, you know, obviously you would say, well, I just want to make sure we're clear. You know, this is what I'm hearing. Is that what you really want to do, okay? So again, when we're talking about medications, we said that we have to know how the drug works, which is mechanism of action, right? So like, in other words, albuterol is a bronchodilator. So we give it to someone who's having bronchoconstriction, like in an asthma attack, to relax their um, bronchioles. Indication why we would give it, because they're having trouble breathing and they have wheezing. The dose in this case is prepackaged, but it's 2.5 milligrams and three mLs. The route of administration is inhalation, right? Because they breathe it in as a nebulizer. Um, really no contraindication necessarily for us to do it, okay? Adverse effects or, or side effects would be that they get a little shaky and jittery. And um, again, special considerations would be things don't usually pertain to us because we're doing emergency medicines, but sometimes, you know, they'll say, if the patient's over 70, give them half the dosage. That, you know, none of our medications are that way, but, you know, certain, there'll be certain situations people say who have renal failure, uh, liver problems, just because they have a harder time clearing the medications out. But again, in our situation, since we're only treating emergencies, they assume we're giving it because it's a, it's a you know, emergency situation that has to be, you know, dealt with immediately. So we don't really have special considerations too, too much. Okay, so when you're when you're calling for orders, so to speak, when you're calling to speak to medical direction, you know they're probably going to want to know a little bit about the, um, you know, the situation, the patient before they give you permission to do something. So again, I would think the main thing that you're going to call, um, you know, medical direction for would be something, you know, like like the uh, epinephrine in the asthma patient. So again, you're going to have to say, I'm treating a 47 year old patient with a history of asthma. Uh, he was complaining of severe difficulty breathing. At this point, he's barely talking. He's unable to use the nebulizer. Um, you know, his pulse oximetry is very low. He's hypoxic. He's cyanotic. You know, we feel like, you know, this is a, a life-threatening problem. Um, you know, set of vital signs. You already gave the signs and symptoms. You know, allergies only just to say he has no, you know, I mean, again, they're not going to care about allergies to epinephrine because you really can't have an allergy to epinephrine because you make epinephrine in your body. 
okay, whatever medications he's on. And obviously his pertinent past medical history is that he's an asthmatic and having an asthma attack. So just brief, right? Because you need orders right away if you're calling in that kind of situation. And then the doctor again will say, fine, it's okay to give epinephrine. It's an adult, so 0.3 milligrams intramuscular, right? I am, I am is the route, okay? And then you repeat back. You know, just so I'm clear, you said it's okay for us to give, you know, 0.3 milligrams of epinephrine intramuscularly, and you repeat it back, okay? Now they have either the five rights or the six rights of drug administration um, that, you know, there's always a question on the test about this. Now, it doesn't really pertain so much to EMS, right? Because think about it, do I have the right patient? Well, obviously in EMS, we typically have one patient at a time. In a hospital, a nurse may walk into a room and there's two patients, so she has to make sure that she has the right patient. Okay, is it the right time to administer medication? Again, in a hospital, patients get medications at a certain time, but we're treating them in an emergency setting. So obviously the time we think we need to give it is the right time. So that's why I'm saying it doesn't really pertain. So right patient, right time. Obviously right medication is important, right dose is important. But again, most of our medications are very standard, simple one-time doses that we don't really have to draw up a whole lot, maybe aspirin. You know, we have to remember how many to give and epinephrine, if we're not using an auto injector, we have to remember how much to draw out. Okay. And then again, right route of medication. And then when they say the six, the only thing they include here, okay, is the right documentation, which means that when you're writing the report up, you have to paint the picture, right? A report is basically a picture that somebody could read and understand how the patient was when you got there. Okay, why you did what you're gonna, you know, you did for the patient and, you know, how the patient responded to that treatment. So if you're saying that, you know, we're gonna give a patient an albuterol treatment, your documentation should make it totally clear that the patient is having an asthma attack or is wheezing, you know, having trouble breathing, their, their respiratory rate, their pulse oximetry. If, after you give them the, and, and when you document the albuterol, you have to document, you know, how much you gave, how you gave it, everything we just talked about. And then you have to document after you gave it to them, their response to the medication. Did they get better? Did they stay the same? Did they get worse? And what's a repeat set of vital signs, okay? Now, routes of administration, okay? So we're gonna go over all these in detail, but oral or swallowed would be our aspirin. Some ling sublingual, lingual means tongue. So sublingual is a medication that goes under the tongue. And again, there's blood vessels, a lot of blood vessels under your tongue. So it's quickly absorbed. So that'd be like your nitroglycerin. Inhaled would be like your albuterol. Okay. Um, intranasal would be your, um, your intranasal Narcan or Naloxone that we use for opioid overdoses. You don't give intravenous or injected in vein medications, right? Only paramedics do that. You do do intramuscular or you are going to be allowed to do intramuscular for um, the epinephrine if your agency doesn't have an auto injector. An auto injector, I'll show you in a second, is basically a way of giving medication in a syringe that you don't have to actually draw up. It's basically a pre-filled pre up syringe with a spring-loaded device that pushes the medication in for you. It's what patients get when they need epinephrine. You know, you don't want a patient who's dying to have to draw up their own drug and, you know, get the right amount and give it to themselves. So it's basically a quick, safe way of giving medications. The problem, obviously, is the expense. It's a very expensive, um, you know, like an auto-injector you know, the, the brand name best auto injector out there is like 500, 600 bucks for, you know, a package or two. So the state now allows EMTs to actually draw up the medication because it's much cheaper. Um, subcutaneous was the way we used to give medications, but intramuscular goes deeper into the muscle where you'll see in a second where subcutaneous is just right under the skin. The deeper you go into the body, the more quickly it's absorbed. So an intramuscular injection is absorbed quicker than a subcutaneous. So now we only give the epinephrine intramuscularly right into the muscle. And that's really pretty much how you've gotten all your medications when you've gotten antibiotics or anything like that. Okay, so every injection you ever received in your life was probably intramuscular, unless you went for some allergy testing or something like that. Intraosseous EMTs don't do, but we use a drill to go into the bone marrow cavity. So long bones, we said in the middle are hollow and that's where the red blood cells are produced. And I shouldn't say hollow, they kind of look like a sponge almost in the inside. And uh, there's a lot of blood vessels because obviously there's red blood cells being produced and it, you can drill into there and have a way of giving medications to a patient when you for whatever reason can't get a regular IV. And then again, you're not doing endotrach endotracheal medications, but that's when we intubate somebody and pass a tube into their trachea, we can spray medications down there um, and they get down all the way to the alveoli where they cross over into the pulmonary capillaries and they're absorbed, okay? 
Transdermal will be medications that are applied by patch on the skin. And again, EMTs don't really uh, have to give medications that way, but that we saw the other night when we saw people who have really bad angina pectoris, they may have to have a nitroglycerin patch on when we're talking about the fibrillation. We said sometimes we wouldn't have to remove those patches if they're in the way. Okay. Okay, so let's go through them now. Um, we're gonna talk about different routes. They don't ask this on the test uh, in New York State, but enteral versus parenteral. So enteral means that they enter the body by being swallowed into the gastrointestinal tract, uh, swallowed into the stomach. Parental means they're getting into the body any other way. So they're injected into the skin, injected into a blood vessel, they're inhaled into the lungs, or they're placed on the skin and they're absorbed. So it just matters how it gets into the body, okay? So enteral again means you got it into your body, the medication into your body by swallowing it, okay, down your throat, into your esophagus, into your stomach. Any other way, whether it be injected, inhaled, absorbed, or anything like that, okay, would be parenteral. So, they, but they don't ask that question on our test. So the first route we'll talk about is oral, okay? So the first thing you know is to give a patient oral medication, they have to be conscious and alert and oriented, right? You can't put something in someone's mouth that's not conscious, alert, and oriented because they can choke on it. So the medications that we would give orally are aspirin in somebody who you th we think is having a heart attack, okay? Oral glucose in a diabetic whose sugar is low, but is still conscious, right? Because we can't put it in their mouth if they're unconscious because they choke on it. And activated charcoal. Charcoal is basically partially burnt wood and it has the ability, or charcoal has the ability to absorb things. Um, which like if anybody has a fish tank, right? The filter has charcoal in it, it absorbs the, the waste product in the water. Um, you know, so char if you have a, some, some of the water filters people have, have charcoal filters in them. So charcoal has a, um, a good ability to kind of absorb things. So when we give activated charcoal, it's basically this wood that's ground up into a fine powder and then mixed with water. And we tell the patient to drink it. Now, the success of having them drink it is pretty poor because it looks horrible, it tastes horrible and stuff like that. But, you know, we sometimes have to do that. It's for a poisoning where the patient has just taken it. So in other words, it's the, the poison is still in there or, or their medication, too much medication, whatever it is, it's still in their stomach. In other words, it's been only, they've only taken it within the last half hour. So it's still in their stomach. So we introduce charcoal down into there the charcoal will bind with the, the drug or the poison and not let it get absorbed by the blood vessels. And then you'll just go to the bathroom and it'll come out, okay? So again, you know, to give medications by the oral route, the patient has to be awake. That means responsive and able to follow commands, okay? The advantage is this is the way people really think to take their medications. It's not painful and stuff like that. The biggest disadvantage is that we can't treat unconscious patients and that the absorption of the medication is slow. So when we say absorption, means for medications to work, they have to get into your bloodstream. So the quickest way a medication can get into your bloodstream is if you inject it into a bloodstream by injecting into the vein. But again, EMTs are not allowed to do that. That's what an IV is and stuff like that. The, so the disadvantage of medications going the oral route, okay, would be that the absorption of it has pretty slow, especially if the person ate food recently, because now in the stomach, besides the medication that you're giving them would be food. And that just like the food, the good stuff in the food gets absorbed, right, in your, by the blood vessels that line your stomach and intestine, the same thing the drug will. So if it has to compete with the food, it won't get absorbed as well. So medications given by the oral route are not usually emergency medications, okay? It's usually, you know, medications that can go to work slower, okay? The next route is the sublingual route, and that's under, under the tongue, okay? And we said the only medication that we give sublingually is nitroglycerin. And the other night we talked about that nitroglycerin is a very fast acting vasodilator. Okay, so it opens up blood vessels. And we said that in the condition of angina pectoris, okay, or, or the, the translation is pain in the chest, that angina pectoris is somebody who had coronary artery disease. Remember your coronary arteries are the arteries that are on the surface of your heart that give blood to the heart to allow it to work, okay? That those coronary arteries are clogged up because of years of you know not eating well. And that the blood flow going through them is diminished. And now the person probably did something, some kind of exertion, something physical, and they need to get more blood to their heart because it's working harder and they can't. So the, the heart tissue now reverts from aerobic metabolism to anaerobic metabolism and lactic acid builds up in the heart muscle and it causes pain, okay? 
And typically the patient will sit down, start to relax themselves and so on. And, the, and this, since they're reversing what brought it on, the pain starts to go away. But if when we still get there, okay, the pain is still there and the patient has a prescription because we don't carry nitroglycerin on the ambulance. But if the patient still has a prescription for nitroglycerin, okay, then we can um, administer the nitroglycerin to them. Okay, and we said there's some precautions that their blood pressure had to be over 120 systolic. They should not have taken erectile dysfunction medications in the last 72 hours, but we're gonna go over all this in a few minutes, okay? So the advantage of this, go ahead, somebody a question? That other medication. What's that? Not, if the patient has any other medication for any other reason, EMTs are not allowed to assist them to take it if they haven't taken it and it caught, this is what causes the problem? So technically, no. Um, you can use a patient's EpiPen if they don't have, if you don't have an EpiPen, you can assist the patient, you know, you can use their EpiPen, but the only ones that uh, technically you would be allowed to assist them with would be nitroglycerin and their EpiPen if you don't have your own. If you have your own, I used to say to use theirs because, you know, it's expensive to use the, the you know, EpiPen for the ambulance and a lot of ambulance courses don't have a lot of money. Uh, not so much in Ramapo because in Ramapo they get tax money. But um, the um, reason I don't say nowadays to use a patient is you don't know how, what kind of climate, what kind of temperature the people maintain the medication at. And medications are very um, susceptible to changes in temperature, right? If they're kept too cold or too hot, they break down. So pretty much now I say that, you know, even if the patient had it um, and hasn't taken it, you should probably just use your own. Okay, so the advantage of sublingual is that it's very rapidly absorbed on the tongue. I'm talking, you know, pretty much immediately. The advantage is it's nice, quick, and easy, right? The disadvantage is in older people, it's actually kind of hard to instruct them to lift their tongue up. You almost have to show it to them. And if for some reason you can't get them to lift their tongue up, right, because they have to lift their tongue towards the roof of their mouth so you can get under it, the only way to grab a tongue and lift it you can't do it with gloves. You, ha you have to have gloves on, but you can't actually grab it with the gloves because you'll just slip right off, is to use the gauze pad, the four by four, and grab the tongue, right, with the four by four and lift it up. Any other way, you won't be able to, um, to hold on to it, okay? And again, technique is that you have them either lift their tongue or um, you lift their tongue for them. And then it's either sprayed if you have the spray form or tablet form under it. It's either one tablet or one spray under the tongue. Okay, and we'll talk more, you know, as we go on. Inhalation, again, we use albuterol and oxygen by go by, that's basically that the medication is being inhaled into the lungs and absorbed through the alveoli and pulmonary capillaries, okay? Very rapid onset, okay? And again, oxygen or albuterol, okay? Advantages is it's a good way of giving medications that need to get down into the lungs quickly. Disadvantages, the patient has to be breathing well, okay? And, you know, with the, with albuterol has to be conscious and able to, um, you know, follow commands to be able to use it, right? You can't, you can't put a, um, a nebulizer in somebody's hands who are unconscious and expect them to be able to use. There are nebulizer masks that I showed you. So sometimes in patients that are, you know, still breathing deeply, but maybe not so awake, we can use that. But most of the times to be able to use albuterol well, the patient has to be conscious and alert. Now, subcutaneous route, again, is injecting medications under the skin. Years ago, it's how we gave epi, okay? But nowadays, we'd use the intramuscular route. So look at these different pictures here. So intramuscular mean you would give the injection, right, at a 90-degree angle, means straight into the arm or leg, wherever you're giving it, and you're going right deep into the muscle, okay? It's a longer needle. It's typically a needle an inch to, a, to an inch and a half long, okay? And it's a bigger gauge. I mean, the thickness of the needle, okay? So obviously it's a little more painful. Subcutaneous means that you're giving it at a 45 degree angle. So it's a shorter needle and you're only going into what they call the subcutaneous tissue, okay? Which is the fat just above, uh, just under the skin above the muscle, okay? And anybody who's had a tuberculosis test, that's called a transdermal where they just basically inject it right under your epidermis and it makes a little bubble on your skin. That's usually only used for testing purposes. So the only time you probably had a transdermal injection is if you got a TB test, tuberculosis test, or if you were going for allergy testing, okay? But again, when you went and got an antibiotic shot or a vaccine, you got an intramuscular injection, whether it was in your, your gluteus maximus or your butt, 
or your deltoid muscle of your upper arm, okay? So that's the better way of giving it. Again, advantages is it's a quick way to give medications and it's absorbed fairly quick, not as quick as intramuscular. Disadvantages, you have to be trained to give shots and patients obviously are scared of shots, okay? And then the other route is intramuscular. Okay, again, the drug we would use is epinephrine. Okay, we're injecting it deeper into the body, right? So we're giving the injection in 90 degree. I spoke with David the other day about the pharmacology labs coming up. So I'm gonna make sure he has all the right stuff to be able to you know, do all the different skills that we need to do. It's gonna be a long day. Um, you know, I don't even know if actually in four hours, well, you. you you know, I, I don't know. I have to figure out how he's going to do it because it's a lot of things that you have to review that day. And I told him also to bring out the Lucas, the automatic CPR machine, the called Lucas and the uh, CPAP. Okay, intranasal means that we're spraying it up the nose, and obviously you know there's lots of blood vessels lining the nose because we said that when we breathe through our nose that the air is warmed by the warm blood in those blood vessels. It's moisturized by the warm blood, uh, by the moisture from the blood in the, uh, in the uh, capillaries lining the inside of the nose. So medications that sprayed up the nose, okay, are absorbed very, very quickly, as long as there's not a lot of mucus up the nose, or if the patient uh, didn't take some type of vasoconstrictive medication up the nose, like Afrin or cocaine or something like that or there's not trauma blood you know, coming out of the nose. So it's a quick, simple way to give, and you're gonna see probably more medications being done by the intranasal route. They're actually now making a med medication to stop seizures uh, in a form that could go up the nose. And I could see that being allowed to be used by EMTs probably in the next five, six years, because it's, a, you know, right now EMTs don't have a way of stopping a seizure in a patient who's seizing. This would be a quick, simple way to be able to do it. Um, there is a rectal gel Valium as a suppository that's approved for EMTs to use, but they don't actually carry it. It requires that the patient has it or the family has it. So you probably, if any of you work in a group home, you're probably familiar with that because a lot of times uh, children in group homes have seizure disorders. So there's two ways that we give the intranasal Narcan. One is that we actually draw it up in a regular syringe and we attach, uh, what do you ask me? Oh. So uh, so one of the students is saying it doesn't matter because in five or six years, you'll all be paramedics. So you'll be able to do it anyway. So hopefully that'd be nice. I could retire then. Okay, so um, this way you would draw it up out of the vial, you know, out of the bottle that it comes in with a regular syringe. And at the end of then you take off the needle and you replace it with this little white device up here. And what it basically is, it's stuck up the nose. And when you spray it through the device and it's up the nose, it turns it into this fine mist and it's quickly absorbed. So this is how we did it for the first year or two that it came out, but it requires you to draw it up and everything like that. So it took a, a longer time. So obviously some company saw a marketing thing and came up with a one shot deal where the medication is in here. Okay. And you stick this up their nose and you push this and it sprays the medication up. So this is um, the main uh, way that we do it now. And the only reason we do it because it's $75 a dose. The only way we do it this way is that it's actually, we get it for free. Um, the government uses money from, they confiscated from uh, drug seizures and they distribute it to the states and some of the money is used to buy this. So right now we get it for free. So it's the uh, way we give it, but it's quick one shot, you know, and uh, I'll talk about the dosing and stuff because you can make out, it says it has four milligrams on it, but the actual dose um, that we usually give is two milligrams. But what happens is it's four milligrams in here, but the patient typically only absorbs two of the four milligrams just because it's such a small amount of fluid. I'll talk about that more when we get to the section. Okay, so that's the way we give it, right? So we said that we want to always reassess the patient after we give a drug, okay, and then documentation, okay? In other words, how did the patient, why we gave it? So the documentation should be like why you gave it, when you gave it, Okay, how the patient responded to it. And if, of course, if you're gonna need to give a second dose, you have to paint a clear picture of how the patient didn't improve enough and you need to give a second dose. Now, the medications that we carry on the ambulance are these, activated charcoal for poisonings, albuterol for bronchoconstriction, trouble breathing, aspirin for a patient we think is having a heart attack, epinephrine for a patient who's having an anaphylactic or severe allergic reaction, and with medical control's permission, also in an asthmatic who's dying in front of us, naloxone or Narcan for an opioid overdose, oral glucose for a diabetic whose sugar is low, okay? 
but is able to swallow without any risk of choking, and oxygen for patients who have low oxygen levels. Okay, again, we define that as a pulse ox below 94%. So activated charcoal is in a bottle so they can't see what it is. Because like I said, it's basically a black syrupy, you know, mixture of crushed up wood and water. So it doesn't taste good. It doesn't look good. They do mix it in a sugary solution. So if you see, uh, let's see. Uh, well, doesn't say it on these, but one, one should say in sorbitol. So sorbitol is a sugar-like solution, and then there's one not. Um, nobody knows the difference, but the reason that there's two is that the diabetic can't get the one with the sugar. So, you know, but I, I have to be honest with you on the ambulance, they buy whatever the cheapest. They don't know the difference between them and stuff like that. I don't remember which one. I'm just trying to see an acronym. Uh, nope, doesn't say. Oh, here. So this one says with sorbitol. So this is the one with sugar. Usually the red one is the one with sugar, but I don't see this one over here saying it. Okay. Um, the usual dose of activate. Sorbitol should be okay with uh, American. What's that? Sorbitol is a sugar that should be okay with uh, the American, I think, no? I don't know. I just know they usually don't give it to diabetics. That's why they have the other one. Is sorbitol okay for diabetics? I don't know that. Uh, I don't know. I have to look it up. I don't see how, if it's a sugar, it'd be okay, unless it's a, um, an artificial sweetener, you know, then there's not, it's not really a sugar. Okay. So again, we give it in a situation. So this is what it looks like, right? So it really just looks like, you know, black, 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 pasty, you know, it's gritty. It's, you know, you taste it on your tongue when you, it feels like a uh, sand on your tongue when you uh, drink it. So the, the patient can't actually see what it looks like. Cause what you do is you cut the tip off of this and you tell them to squeeze it into their mouth. And that's again, because if somebody, you handed somebody a cup of this, they would not drink it. Right. So it is a little obstacle to get them to drink it. Okay. Um, and a lot of times it's too late. Like, in other words, if they say to you that they took the poison, you know, two hours ago, or they took the, uh, the medications two hours ago, it's already absorbed, so it's too late to give it. So it's typically somebody who's taken, you know, only taking the medication within the last 30 minutes to an hour that we would give it to them. Um, I've had some success in telling patients if they don't drink it, that when they get to the hospital, they're going to shove a tube down their nose into their stomach and pour it down there. So it'd probably be easier for you just to drink it. Um, just remember, it's not designed to make a patient vomit, but it doesn't taste great. And you're putting them in an ambulance and they're facing backwards and you're bouncing them to the hospital. So you can cause a patient to vomit by giving them this, not that it's the actual design of it. Okay. Um, what else? Okay. So it has many different names to it. Okay. And again, it only can work. It can only bind to a drug that's not absorbed by the blood vessels in the stomach. So that's why I'm saying that it has to be given fairly quickly after the person um, ingested it, after the person took it and got it into their stomach. So, and sometimes people are, you know, not so honest and stuff like that, okay? And it basically absorbs the poison, absorbs the medication so the body cannot absorb it, okay? So it's like putting a sponge down into their, you know, belly to absorb up the, the bad medication. So who can we not give it to? So obviously, um, so somebody wrote for what poisons examples can be used for. So I guess I shouldn't really say poisons. I should really say drug overdoses. Um, you know, so it's probably, it's probably a better way to say you know, like medication overdoses. So if somebody took too much of a medication is probably a better way to give this because poisons, a lot of times we don't want to do something to slow it from getting out of the body. We want to give sometimes antidotes to it. And we'll talk about that when we do toxicology. Um, so I probably should have said, you know, that they took too much of a medication or you took a medication they're not supposed to take. So somebody said, does vomiting help a patient when poisoned? So the issue with making it, years ago, we used to carry uh, a medication called Sirpavipacac. And Sirpavipacac is a medication that would cause a patient to vomit very quickly, usually within five to 20 minutes. And when somebody said that they took something they weren't supposed to take, we gave it to them and had them vomit. There were a couple of issues with it. One is if the medication the patient took was a medication that could make them sleepy, since the Ipecac took sometimes 20, 30 minutes to kick in, the problem would be that, you know, now you give them a medication that's going to make them vomit and they pass out. So now you have the risk of aspiration. The other problem was that the vomiting of the Sirpavipacac was very, very, very forceful. So that 
a lot of times people like it was, you, you know, everybody's thrown up and it's not a pleasant experience and it hurts, but this is like vomiting, you know, 10 times worse than normal. And, you know, there are cases of people with severe vomiting, you know, especially women in their first trimester of pregnancy where they could actually, um, you know, separate their esophagus from their stomach and stuff like that. So we don't carry syrup of the anymore. So somebody asked, can you use it for alcohol? No, because when somebody's drunk, right, they're not conscious enough and you give them something. Oh, you're saying, can the activated charcoal be used for alcohol? I don't think so. Alcohol is very quickly absorbed. Okay. You know, really within minutes absorbed into your bloodstream. So it's not something um, that, you know, you wouldn't have time to give, um, to give activated charcoal. So no, but definitely not syrup of Ipecac because you don't want to give, again, something that would make somebody vomit to another thing that makes them sleepy and stuff like that. Okay, so contraindications, patient's not completely awake, right? They have an altered mental status. Patient's able to swallow, okay? Uh, you don't get permission for medical control or a patient has ingested something that burns, right? So acids like the thing underneath the sink, right? The drain cleaners, that crazy stuff. We use Pesach time to clean the... Um, the pots and pans, you know, I forgot what it's called, but that stuff you spray it on there and it dissolves everything. And if you get it on your hands, yes, yes. Um, so, you know, um, you, you don't want to, you don't want to do that because what it'll do is it'll hold on to it longer, right? You want that to kind of, you want to give stuff to neutralize the acid and stuff like that. So um, you got to really make sure if you have this stuff under your, you know, your sink or in your, you know, basement or something like that is really out of the way of children. It, this, that stuff is very, very, very dangerous. Okay, they're not going to ask you for the dosage of activated charcoal on the state exam, but basically it's one gram per kilogram of body weight. A kilogram is 2.2 pounds. So if somebody weighed 220 pounds or 100 kilograms, so be, they would get 100 grams. It's carried anywhere. If you look over here, whoops, not too far. So like this one is 25 grams. This one is 25 grams. Okay. I think the other one was 46 or 48 grams. So you always have to read because this doesn't look as big as the other ones did, but it doesn't mean anything because it could be more concentrated in there. So typically on most, um, you know, most patients, we give about 25 to 50 grams as a first dose in an adult and half of that in a child, okay? Um, some of the side effects you can see with, with activated charcoal, okay, is their stomach could start getting pain, could get cramping. Later, they're gonna be constipated. When they go to the bathroom, it's gonna look just like the fluid. So it's gonna look very uh, black and tarry. They get nauseous, definitely. And vomiting, I said, is a big risk, okay? Um, so again, before you give activated charcoal, you have to make sure there's no danger that your patient can choke on it or aspirate it into their lungs, okay? And whatever it comes in contact, it will stain their clothing, you know, the, the bench on the ambulance, the sheets are, if they get on it, they're gonna be, you know, not that we keep them and clean them, but I'm just saying it's very, very, um, you know, uh, um, discoloring to stuff, okay? And like I said, um, I have to be honest with you, this is what we do in the ambulance. We actually don't give it to them until we pull up in front of the hospital. That's the safest way to do it, even though, you know, technically you should give it to them as soon as possible so that they have a better chance of absorbing and not absorbing the, the medication they took. Because it's so hard to get them to take it and because they usually throw up, we usually tell them to start drinking it just when we, you know, get out of the ambulance and we're wheeling them in. This way, if they're going to throw up, they're going to throw up in the hospital. That's usually what happens. Um, you know, this way it's not a disaster. I mean, could just imagine a patient throwing that up in the back of an ambulance, what kind of disaster it is. Okay, now that's activated charcoal. The average EMT that you will speak to know if you ask them if they ever gave activated charcoal, the answer is going to be no. I mean, I've probably given it, like I said, a few times, a handful of times. You know, uh, it's very rarely given because, again, by the time we get there, that they probably already have absorbed the medication or they're unconscious and we can't give it to them because they could choke on it. Okay, so albuterol sulfate, we said, is a medication we use and a patient who is having bronchoconstriction. Bronchoconstriction means that the air tubes into the alveoli, the bronchioles, have gotten tight and it's very difficult for the patient to breathe, okay? The classic condition that this happens in is asthma, okay? Um, you can see it in anaphylaxis also, okay? 
And you could also see it a little bit possibly in the COPD or the bronchitis patient and stuff like that. Uh, but the main time, if you said, you know, 96% of the time, it's probably in an asthma patient that you're going to be using albuterol. Um, again, most asthmatics have albuterol as a meter dose inhaler or a puffer that they use as a rescue medication in case their maintenance medications that they take every day to prevent them from having an asthma attack did not work, right? So it's a quick acting bronchodilator that has to be inhaled down into the alveoli to be able to work. We use albuterol as in a nebulizer, okay, as an inhalation type of medication. Um, and given that way, it does work very quickly, but obviously requires a patient to be conscious, alert, and oriented and able to, you know, follow commands and stuff like that, okay? Um, so somebody wrote more than 30 minutes. Do you mean that if a patient took the medication more than 30 minutes ago, is it worthwhile getting giving it to them? So in all honesty, probably not, but it probably would not hurt them unless again, it's a medication that's gonna sedate them and make them sleepy, right? So that's one thing we always, before we give somebody something to drink, we always wanna make sure that the drug they took, the reason we're giving the activated charcoal is not a medication that's gonna sedate them and make them sleepy because we don't want them to vomit with that inside of them because there's a very high risk of it aspirating down into the lungs and it would be a disaster. Okay, so inclusion criteria means a reason why we could give it. So we have a patient who's having trouble breathing and respiratory distress and wheezing. Wheezing is the sound of somebody having bronchoconstriction. And if we remember, I said that wheezing typically starts on on exhalation, not inhalation. And the reason why is that when you breathe in, it's a forceful bringing in of the air and the, and the bronchioles that are narrowed by the asthma attack, the air actually forces them open and travels well into the alveoli. But when you go to exhale, that's passive, right? There's not a lot of force. It's only that air coming out of the alveoli. There's no muscles working it. So there it's harder for the air to leave the lungs and as it's traveling through the narrow bronchioles, just like if you put your fingers in your lips, it makes a whistling sound. And the wheezing is that whistling sound. Okay, so that's what the wheezing actually is. So again, a patient who's wheezing, early on, it'll be expiratory wheezing. As they get worse, it'll be expiratory and inspiratory. Okay, and then again, the, the worst thing would be is somebody who was wheezing, if they stop wheezing and it's not because we made them better, it's because they got too tight, which means they're not moving any air. So the best way and the way we do it on the ambulance is to use nebulized albuterol by a, you know, a nebulizer device. If um, you don't have that and a patient has their meter dose inhaler, their puffer, you can assist the patient in doing it. And we said the other night that we would want them to shake it up, forcefully exhale and put it in their mouth. And as they're breathing in, depress the plunger and spray the medication. If we hear them cough after they do that, we know we got it down into their lungs. If they start licking their lips and stuff like that, it means they just sprayed it on their tongue, right? And then it didn't work, okay? And then the contraindications to using a meter dose inhaler is that somebody's not awake enough, right? In other words, they can't actually, you can't just stick it in their mouth and spray it because it has to be timed with them breathing in. And we're not supposed to use medications that are not the patient. So like somebody's having an asthma attack and they forgot their meter dose inhaler, but their friend has one, it's not the patient's. So technically we're not supposed to be using somebody else's medication to treat a, you know, our patient, okay? So what does it, what's the action of albuterol? It's a fast acting bronchodilator. So bronchodilator means it opens up the bronchioles, makes it easier to get air in, and we use it to treat an emergency that's causing bronchoconstriction. We said the main emergency is asthma, could also happen, you know, in an allergic reaction, okay? Usually in an allergic reaction, since we give them the epinephrine, the epinephrine amongst all the other things it does, also causes bronchodilation. So we don't usually have to give them albuterol, but it has been added to the anaphylaxis protocol besides the asthma protocol. Okay, so again, it does have side effects. It does make them nervous, jittery, okay, uh, and stuff like that, okay. Very rarely causes chest discomfort, but it's possible. Definitely causes some tachycardia, makes them shake, that's the tremors and stuff like that. Okay, so it does have some side effects, but the alternative is, you know, that they can't breathe. So the, the side effects are minimal in comparison to the fact that they usually cannot get air in, okay? So the, the albuterol protocol basically is a patient, it, for a patient who's in respiratory distress and they're wheezing, okay? Uh, there is some people who have, some patients who have asthma, then instead of wheezing, they cough a little bit. It's called cough variant asthma. So it's not a hacking cough like when you have bronchitis. It's a very weak cough, like a, <laughs> like they feel like they can't catch their breath. Um, if they use albuterol in the management of that, you can still treat them 
with uh, your nebulized albuterol. If they say they don't use albuterol, then you can't treat them if they have that coffearent asthma. Okay, so your EMS agency has to have approval by the, the state to use uh, albuterol, which pretty much every agency does. And you have to have training in doing it, which you will have in ENT class. Again, it's prepackaged. I'll show it to you in a second. It's 2.5 milligrams of the drug and three mLs of normal saline, and that's salt water. We put it in a nebulizer and we adjust the flow rate from the reg oxygen regulator, okay, at four to six liters per minute. You don't have to uh, delay transport. In other words, you don't have to stay in the house to finish the albuterol, okay? In other words, as soon as you get it going, you move them outside or you move them outside, put them in the ambulance and then give them the treatment, but you don't wanna, you know, stay in the house and say, I have to stay in the house till I finish the treatment, okay? And uh, EMTs are allowed to give up to three doses of albuterol. So you give the first dose, if they don't feel 100% better, you can give them a second dose, they don't feel 100% better, you give them three doses. But again, you're not gonna stay in the scene to finish any of those dosages. You're gonna do it in route to the hospital. Okay, so again, it's indication is a relief of bronchospasm or bronchoconstriction due to an exacerbation of asthma or anaphylaxis or anything that causes bronchoconstriction. An exacerbation means a worsening, right? So when they say the, the you know, an, an exacerbation of asthma means an asthmatic who's having an asthma attack. It's just a fancy medical way of saying it. Because it's a little straining or taxing on the heart, they always have this little footnote saying, use caution with patients who have had previous heart attack, congestive heart failure, angina, or arrhythmias. Arrhythmias are the term for abnormal rhythms. It's not a good way of actually, for those of you that remember the things, A in front of something means that it's not there. So this is actually probably should be a systole, right? Arrhythmias. It's really usually said dysrhythmias, D-Y-S, which means not normal. Okay, but to know if somebody doesn't have a normal EKG, um, they have a history of AFib or they have a history of something, um, again, usually you will still treat them. There would not be a reason not to treat them, but they always just say use caution. Okay. Uh, contraindication when you would not give it. So hypersensitivity means allergies. So anybody who says they're allergic to albuterol or its components, um, you would not give it to them. Again, it's pretty hard to be allergic to albuterol, but I have had patients tell me, they can't use albuterol, they have an allergic reaction when they have it, so you can't give it to them. And if the patient's in respiratory failure, remember there's three stages when somebody's having a respiratory emergency. There's respiratory distress, which is the early stage that we typically get patients in when they're having trouble breathing. If that continues uncorrected, the muscles start to weaken because of the lack of oxygen, the struggling to breathe. They go into respiratory failure where their tidal volume, the amount of air they bring in and out with each breath drops. So it still looks like they're breathing, but they're not moving air deep enough through their respiratory tracts. So they're not having good gas exchange. So if they're in respiratory failure, the albuterol won't actually make it down to the alveoli, right? So then in that case, it's too late for the albuterol. We would probably have to start bag valve mask and then call medical control for permission to use the intramuscular epinephrine. Again, 2.5 milligrams and three mLs. We give it a nebulizer at four to six liters per minute. Most of the times it's six liters per minute. Okay, I mean, that's what I always do. I've never done four liters per minute. Uh, don't go faster than six because you'll just use the medication up too quickly. They won't have time to um, you know, absorb it all. Okay, again, we repeated up to three doses. Okay, typically a nebulizer takes, I would say a nebulizer takes more than like five minutes to finish up, not 10 minutes. Um, you know. So as soon as you see the nebulizer not misting anymore, what I would do is take it out of your mouth, tap it a little bit. I'll show you what I mean, or I'll have them show you what I mean in class. But what happens is, you know, there's that chamber that the medication goes in that I think I'm gonna show you in a second. So after it's been running for a few minutes, a lot of that medication is adhering to the wall and it's not available to turn into a mist. So by taking it out of the mouth and slapping it, the, well, the water, the liquid part of it drops to the bottom and then you'll get a few more minutes of uh, nebulization out of it. And, you know, then once it completely is used up, you would switch to a, you know, give a new one if the patient doesn't feel 100% better. Okay, so again, what do we do? Okay, we want to assemble a nebulizer. Again, we'll practice in class, but I'll show you. We add the medication to the nebulizer. We attach it to the oxygen, okay, and we set it to, at six liters per minute. And then we instruct the patient on how to use it. So, what we want them basically do is that to breathe it deeply and hold it for a second. Now, if they're having a really bad asthma attack, they're not going to be able to do that because it's hard for them to breathe. So you could tell them every third breath, every fourth breath, take a nice deep breath, hold it for a second, okay, and then let it out. And if it starts to work, if they're actually getting it down where they need it to go, they will also have that weak, ineffective cough like, the <laughs> like that. And that's a good sign. 
that's telling you that the medication is getting down into their alveoli and starting to open them up. Okay, so we like to see that. Okay, so we, we said that to put it together, we have to screw this part over here, okay? I usually then pour the medication right down here. Um, it is, you could put the medication right in here now and then screw this on top, but I tend to spill more uh, that way. Okay, so you're gonna put that together. The oxygen tubing plugs in from the underneath into this little piece down here, okay? And then the T piece goes on top here. So this piece goes here and then it'll be sitting this way. And then on one side of the T piece goes the mouthpiece, you see over here. And a lot of them have the nebulized tubing out the other end, okay? And then you have them hold it. You're running at a six liters per minute, it flows in. This is the main way a lot of people carry albuterol. It's in a prepackaged clear plastic tube. It may not look exactly like that, but you know that's kind of the main way that people carry it. Okay, so everything's in here. You basically hold it, you twist off the top, and you squeeze it, turn it, you know, pour it upside down, and squeeze it into the uh, chamber. I think I mentioned the other night that um, the, it's best not to have one finger here and one finger on the back of it because it's soft here. And what happens when you go to twist this off, the little pressure you have squeezes out some of the drug. So put one finger along this side, one finger along this side, try not to uh, press very hard, okay? And then you could twist it and take it off. Or some people just hold it with one hand between two fingers, like right over here, uh, kind of like this, right? With just two fingers, and then they twist it off over here. You're always gonna have a tiny little bit spill out. Um, you can minimize how much spills out if you just, tap this part gently down on the table for a second and get all the medication to get low down in the in the chamber here before you uh, twist it. This is the nebulizer, obviously running with oxygen through it, okay? And they have the corrugated tubing on the other end. You don't have to have it, but it does work better with the corrugated tubing. Not all of them come that way because it's a little extra money. I said that after a couple of minutes, it's not gonna be misting as much. So take it away from them for a second and just, tap the side of this with your hand, kind of go like that a couple times and you'll see a lot of water will drip back down to the bottom, okay? And then you can give it back to them, they'll get another minute or two out of it. This is the nebulizer mask I was talking about if the patient can't hold it. So what happens is instead of putting the T piece on, you screw these two pieces together, but you don't use this and this, okay? You take this right here without the T piece on and you stick it right up into here and then you could strap it to the patient's face or hold it in front of their face. And it's just another way of giving it if the patient's having a hard time holding it. This is the meter dose inhaler. There's many different types of meter dose inhalers, but again, we're only allowed to use the albuterol meter dose inhaler. If a patient doesn't have, um, you know, you're in a situation where you don't have a nebulizer, you don't have oxygen to run the nebulizer, you know, that type of thing. So if a patient has it, I obviously have a prescription for it and you can assist them in taking it. Again, we said that you wanna shake it up for a second or two, have the patient forcefully um, exhale, and then they put it in their mouth and as they're inhaling, they've depressed down on this and it sprays the medication. They have to breathe it in. And the other night, I think we looked at the spacer devices, which are little tubes that go between the part that goes in your mouth and the patient's mouth. And it just gives the patient more time to inhale it. So that's usually used with kids. Okay, so any questions on the activated charcoal or the um, the albuterol before we go on to aspirin? Any questions on anything? Uh, Frank, the, the charcoal is a cold narcan or narcan nope. is a different thing um, than you give for overdose? Completely different drug. Narcan only works on one overdose, one medication, which is an opioid. There's many different types of opioids, but one class of medication. So yeah, but like charcoal, overdosing with, med with like a medication like Percocet or something, you only use Narcan, correct? But that's an opioid, yes. Okay, but again, Narcan would be used for medications that people took as pills into their body. But but again, you can have opioid pills. So I'll when we get to Narcan, I'll explain to you how you figure out it's an opioid other than the name. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So. Um, Aspirin. So we said the indication for aspirin is somebody who we think is having a heart attack. And we said the medical name for a heart attack is an acute myocardial infarction. So acute means sudden. Myocardial means heart muscle. Myo is muscle. Cardial is heart. Infarction is death of. So our purpose is to, you know, prevent their muscle from dying. So we want to give them aspirin, get them to the hospital before the muscle actually dies. And the reason why aspirin is useful in a heart attack, we said, is that 
unlike angina where there's just a temporary mismatch in the amount of oxygen the heart needs and it's getting because they've exerted themselves and that their coronary arteries are narrowed with the fat. In a heart attack, their coronary arteries are also narrowed with the fat, but they have a rupture, okay, in that fat and the body thinks there's a wound, okay, and it sends platelets to fix the wound and the platelets actually seal the artery off. So they have a complete blockage of the artery. And we said that aspirin interferes with the ability for the platelets to stick together. So it stops the aspirin from sealing off the artery. But remember, whatever damage happened before you got there and gave them the aspirin already happened, you're just preventing any further blocking of the artery. So people wait an hour to call the ambulance. It's kind of, I don't wanna to say too late, but it's not good, right? The people call right away and we can give them aspirin right away. They have a much better outcome. So aspirin is basically what they call an antiplatelet agent because platelets are the culprits, are the, you know, the things that are causing the problem when somebody's having a heart attack, okay? So again, it has many different uh, names, okay? Depending on how you buy it, most of the times people, you know, it's just called aspirin, okay? It's basically a non-narcotic, so it's not an opioid, a non-narcotic pain reliever. It's a fever reducer. It reduces inflammation. So it had many, many uses. It's just that there's better medications out there, Motrin and Tylenol and stuff like that to do all the same things without the side effect of aspirin, which is that it can bother your stomach and cause some bleeding in your stomach, okay? Now, this is basically showing you, you know, what happens, okay, in a, um, in a heart attack, okay? So this person had a deposit of fat, okay? in there, the body grows a cap over it, right? We said to lock it in place, that's that yellow stuff right over here. And for some reason it ruptured, okay? And what happens is that when it ruptures, the body recognizes it as a wound, even though it's not a cut, right? It's not really a wound, the artery is intact. There's no blood leaking out, but the body thinks it's a wound. And whenever it thinks it's a wound, it sends platelets to it. And now the platelets are gonna come and stick and stick and stick and close off the ability for blood to travel through the artery. And that's what basically happens in a heart attack. Okay, so let me show you here. This is a, uh, a cross section of a coronary artery that was taken out of somebody's body who had a heart attack, okay? It looks like a fatal heart attack. So basically what there was, was all in here, okay, was the fat. You see it says lipid core, lipid is fat. So it was the core. This was the cap that was supposed to lock it in place, right? And you could see that the cap broke. You see the, the rupture right in here? And the thrombos, remember we had emboli and we had thrombus, is the thrombos is the clot that developed that sealed off the artery. So this is exactly you know, what killed this patient. Obviously, this is only a one millimeter artery. It's tiny and it was magnified. That's why we can see everything that's going on, okay? So again, this whole part here, right? This whole thing was the center of the artery because the years of eating poorly, he had a ton of fat in here. The body grew a cap to lock it in place. And then that cap ruptured, okay? The body thought it was a wound and it sent platelets and the platelets sealed everything off. You see the platelets went in, they started clogging everything up, but unfortunately they also clogged up what was left of his artery and he had a heart attack, okay? So that's exactly what happens. Any questions on that? Isn't it, isn't, is it only for to, to unclog the platelets? It's not to unclog, remember. It's not gonna break this loose. That requires, we said angioplasty, right? Where they basically bring a catheter with a balloon and they burst through it and they push it up out of the way. And then they leave a metal stent in there so that it doesn't collapse back down. It's like a new tube to be able to get um, blood through. So it's not actually breaking down the thrombos. There are medications called thrombolytics, thrombos, thrombolytics, and thrombolytics can dissolve a clot, okay? But Angioplasty is the better procedure with less side effects than thrombolytics. So they only get thrombolytics if they are um, in a place that cannot do angioplasty, cannot stent open the artery. So all the aspirin is going to do, obviously, this was a guy, this already, this is, you know, terrible. This is completely sealed off. We're talking about we get to somebody and they've only have a 5% occlusion, right? So the platelets have not completely sealed off the artery. This is obviously in somebody probably who died you know, and then autopsy, they took out his coronary artery to examine it. Um, but we're talking, we get there, the person's only had pain for 15, 10 minutes, five minutes, whatever. They don't have a complete closure. They have a 5% closure, not a complete closure. By giving them aspirin, that doesn't go away, right? Because that already happened, but we prevent any more closure. So we just give them more time to get to the hospital to have that angioplasty. 
Okay. Everybody's on clear five, on this? On 5% closing, you can have a heart attack? No. So you could have chest pain. Okay. So let me tell you the first thing. There are people, okay, maybe even some of us, there are people walking right around right now that may have 90% blockage in our coronary artery. Okay. And they have no symptoms. I'll just tell you that happens. Okay. Uh, the reason why is that other blood vessels are giving enough blood to the area of the heart. But obviously you're at high risk, okay, for closing off that artery, but you have no way of knowing because you have no symptoms. You're not going to the hospital. And even if you had symptoms, okay, they have to do what's called a cardiac angiogram where they actually take pictures of the inside of the blood vessels to see that it's occluded. Um, that test I told you that I had the other day, that's supposed to also show that because if the nuclear material doesn't get to every part of the heart, the heart, every part of the heart doesn't glow. So if there's a part of the heart that doesn't show up glowing on the x-ray, they know that possibly that part of the heart is not getting blood. And then they would do the next procedure, which is an angiogram. Okay. So, you know, so can people be walking around with five, 10, 15, 20% occlusions and have no symptoms? Absolutely. And like I said, there's people even have 80, 90% occlusions and, uh, you know, have no symptoms. But for the vast majority of you know, people, um, when they actually have a heart attack, okay, because there's an event going on now, right? There's platelets flowing and there's things happening. People will start having chest pain, right? As they diminish the blood flow through that artery more than it was diminished to start with. So if this guy already, before he had his heart attack, let's look at this, right? This is his whole artery. Before he had his heart attack, I would say he had 60% occlusion, right? Because this whole area wasn't getting any blood through, only this area, even though it's clogged now, this was open, right? Before he had his heart attack, but he already had about 60% occlusion from the fat. So he was, he was running off this artery at 40% to start with, okay? And who knows, maybe he had no symptoms whatsoever until he ruptured the cap and started having the, uh, the chest pain, okay? So there's no real way of, you know, quite knowing what happened, you know, to this patient because we don't know the whole story. But yeah, there's absolutely people walking around, you know, with uh, with fairly significant occlusions. Okay, so excuse me. The indication for aspirin would be somebody who we suspect is having a heart attack. Okay, so most people having heart attacks are going to have chest pain or pressure or some kind of sign of symptom pointing towards their heart. Right? If they're hypersensitive again, which is an allergy to aspirin, obviously we cannot give it to them because that would be a fatal event. If somebody has an anaphylactic reaction in the midst of a heart attack and we have to give them epinephrine, that will basically finish them off because epinephrine makes the heart go crazy. So, you know, and it is possible for people to have allergies to aspirin, okay? So especially older people, like a lot of you never took aspirin in your life. So you probably would not be having an allergic reaction to it because you haven't sensitized your body to it. But older people who have taken aspirin, it is possible for people to have allergic reactions. So, what, so what's the point of aspirin? Why not Tylenol or Motrin? Because Tylenol doesn't do anything to platelets. See, again, it's how the medication works. So how would you, so how would you know that? If somebody complains for chest pain, what, what's going to make you think uh, aspirin over Tylenol or Tylenol over something else? Because I just told you that what we use in a heart attack is aspirin, right? That's the only mm -hmm. thing that we use in a heart attack. If you give somebody Tylenol, Okay, it's fine. You're not going to hurt them, but you're not going to help them if they're having a heart attack because Tylenol does not break, does not stop platelets from sticking together. So the only thing that stops platelets from sticking together is aspirin. Mm -hmm. And then there's medications that have been developed over the years, like Plavix and stuff like that, that also do it. But this is a cheap, simple way of doing it very quickly, works very quickly, very effectively. And also they can tell people you know, I mean, if you're if you're at high risk for a heart attack, they're going to tell you to take a baby aspirin every day, or they may tell you to have it in your house. And if you have chest pain, to take it and call the ambulance. So it's just a quick, simple medication. I mean, you could buy a bottle of aspirin for two, three dollars, right? Is it also a blood thinner? No, a blood thinner is something else, right? So that's a that's a common like people we use blood thinners and and things interchangeably. A blood thinner actually reduces the amount of cells that are in your blood. Okay, so the, in other words, the, the thickness of your blood. So this is just acts on platelets. This is just an antiplatelet agent. Okay, so again, a contraindication would be that they know they're allergic to it. Okay, and then also if somebody is bleeding anywhere in their body, aspirin will make them more likely to bleed. So that's a really a decision for medical control because I've never had, can aspirin be taken with alcohol? I don't know why you would. 
Um, I mean, any any drug you take in combination with alcohol, remember your liver, your liver is the organ that what they call detoxifies, breaks down. So your liver detoxifies aspirin, alcohol, Tylenol, everything. So the more drugs you have in your system, the harder you make your liver work. So, you know, if you're drinking, you probably should stay away from taking medications. If you're taking medications, you should stay away from drinking. So that's basically, you know, how it works. So what I was saying as far as bleeding goes is if somebody has some type of bleeding problem, I don't know, they have some hemorrhoids, they have, a, you know, something or other. Um, I've never had this with a heart attack patient, but I guess it's possible. You have to do what they say, risk, uh, look at the benefit to the risk. What's the benefit of aspirin and a heart attack to the risk of causing more bleeding in the patient? And what I usually tell students is call medical control. Say to them, okay, have a guy, sounds like he's having a heart attack. He's got, you know, crushing chest pressure. He's cool, pale, and diaphoretic. It's been going on for 15 minutes. And he also told us that today he had some bleeding from his rectum and he has a history of hemorrhoids. Do you want us to give him the aspirin or do you want to wait, you know, till we get him to the hospital and see what they say? I'll just warn you that a lot of times when you call the hospital and present it like that, they, they think, you know, you kind of want to just bring them to the hospital. So they may just say, just bring them in, you know, and don't do anything. Okay, adverse effects. So very rarely, again, asthma can cause a mild allergic reaction. So you'll have some wheezing, it can cause bleeding. Okay, definitely can bother your stomach. Heartburn is like where you feel indigestion. Uh, and high, super high doses, it can cause ringing in the ears. Okay, so, but that's not the high doses we're giving. And again, along with the wheezing of the allergic reaction, you get rash or hives, okay? And they're more likely to bruise when they're on aspirin than when they're not. But these are all, nothing we really worry about in somebody having a heart attack. The big thing we worry about is if they have history of true allergic reactions to aspirin, then we cannot give it to them. The dose is 481 milligram chewable baby aspirin, which does not have a hard coating on it. Okay, that's ideally what we'd like to give. And we're gonna tell them to chew it and swallow it. And I said that you have to um, be cautious when you hand it to, because people typically swallow pills, right? So if you just hand it to them, they may just go ahead and swallow it and it's not gonna to go to work right away. So you wanna tell them, you know, you need to chew it up and then swallow it so it goes to work right away. Okay, so they get 481 milligram aspirin. Okay, again, we use a question, people who have allergies to aspirin, okay? So aspirin is the number one reducer of death, okay, in somebody having a heart attack. It is the most important drug, more important than anything, you know, including drugs in the hospital. The early administration of aspirin has been shown to reduce death and heart attacks dramatically. So every patient who's having chest pain that you think is a heart attack should be getting aspirin unless they have a history of severe allergies to aspirin or they have an active bleed somewhere in their body. Okay, any questions on aspirin? Again, 481 milligram chewed and swallowed. The only thing so when the, you give baby, oh, go ahead. So the only time, time you give baby aspirin is when? Somebody you think is having a heart attack. No, is there? No, I thought that's too. There's aspirin, that's baby aspirin. That's the way no, I no, 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 no. So, so I'm sorry. That's the same thing. It's in other words, all baby aspirin is it's 81 milligram pills instead of 325 milligrams. When they say baby aspirin, it's basically that children's aspirin tastes good and is designed to be chewed by a kid. So it, that's the only thing. Like, in other words, it just doesn't have a hard coating on it. Adult aspirin has a hard coating, so it doesn't dissolve in the stomach because they don't want it to bother the stomach. So since we want someone, we want this aspirin to go to work right away on this patient, that's why we use that. It's called non-enterically coated aspirin. It may not even say children's aspirin on it. Actually, do I have a, did I have a picture of a bottle? Uh, so it does say, it says- So when are you giving regular and when are you giving up? You're not, not. Always children chewable, 81 milligram dose oh. aspirin. Oh. Okay. So that Never. means 81, you have to give at least four pills. Four. Yes, that's why. Exactly what we said. Okay. So, four, so you always use baby aspirin? Yes. Non-coded baby aspirin. Yes. Will they feel better or it's not going to nope. get worse? Nope. They will not notice a difference by you giving it to them. Okay. Um, in other words, the only way somebody having a heart attack is going to feel better is when they have that procedure of angioplasty and the narrowed artery is, is forced open. So they're never gonna, you're never gonna see a change in anything. If somebody said I was having terrible chest pain and it went away, that's more of angina, right? Because angina, the pain goes away when they stop doing what brought it on. So a heart attack will not go away until the artery is reopened 
And the only thing that could reopen the artery is, is the angioplasty procedure with the stent put in. Okay. So somebody asked me, uh, why shouldn't every person over the age of 50 have baby aspirin? Now, I don't know if you mean have baby aspirin available to them in the house or take one a day. So I have aspirin in the house. Okay. Um, I did not routinely take one a day, but now with COVID, because there's a, a problem with COVID where people are developing blood clots and having pulmonary embolisms and other things that are, you know, caused by clots, I have been taking a baby aspirin when I remember. Um, I'm not pretty much every day, but whenever I remember, I try to take it. Okay. Um, but the reason we don't just tell the whole world to take an aspirin is that there's side effects to aspirin, right? There's a risk of bleeding. There's a risk of allergies and stuff like that. So people who've had a previous heart attack or a previous stroke where they have a, a blockage in their brain and survived it, a lot of times they will put them on a one a day baby aspirin um, just to prevent or help prevent them having it again. So, um, but yeah, if you have elderly parents, um, you know, I mean, pretty much, listen, you could have a heart attack at 20. It's just rare. Right. But once you get over the age of 40, 45, your risk of heart attack increases just because your arteries are more narrowed because of your poor diet. So, you know, yeah, I would say once you get over the age 40, 45, it wouldn't be a bad idea. I mean, they're not very expensive. You know, the problem is they're going to sit in your medicine cabinet and they're going to expire without being used. Um, so you have to remember at some point, two or three years down the road, replacing them. And you have to remember where you left them, you know, and stuff. So what I've done in my my uh, um, in, in my master bathroom you know my wife has a uh, um on the vanity is two upright closets on either side one's hers one's mine on the door um of mine when you open it up on that panel that you would see i've actually taped like the important medications like epinephrine you know all the like things when my neighbor knocks on the door and says you know my kid's having an allergic reaction I put it right there because, you know, obviously on Shabbos, we have a, leave a light on in the bathroom. So you wouldn't want to, you know, in the dark, try to start fishing around for everything. So I, I just taped everything I would kind of need. Plus, when I open it, it reminds me to look periodically, you know, at the expiration date and stuff like that. So um, that is, 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 is only helps for the platelets to, to yes. whatever. Why would it help of COVID? It's, I, I thought it helped. No. So, so in COVID... So again, remember, we don't know what COVID is, right? So we don't know, first it was a respiratory problem, but what they're seeing now this time around with COVID is there's a lot of patients getting what they call pulmonary embolisms, getting blood clots in the blood vessels in their lungs. Uh, you probably heard this because it was like a big thing a month ago in the Jewish community where seven people died in one week of pulmonary embolisms. So, you know, it's, they don't know everything about what, it, what there is to know about COVID. That's the problem. So, you know, one of the things that happens in COVID is that it makes your blood thicker, okay? And there are people that are having those types of problems. So, you know, that was something that was happening. A big talk, you know, a month, month and a half ago, uh, right after Pesach and Purim and Pesach and everything like that. But now, you know, it doesn't seem to be as pressing a thing. Now, who knows? Maybe those people had other issues going on. But, you know, to have seven people die in a week, you know, in, in the community is a lot of patients, you know, I mean, percentage wise. So somebody asked, are you giving the patient four pills straight up? or give one weight? Nope, all four at the same time. The dose is 324 milligrams. It's a good question. So you're giving all four, chew and swallow them one in one shot. I mean, if they can't chew four at a time and they wanna chew one, swallow it, chew two, swallow it, that's fine. That's not a problem, but you don't have to give one every five minutes apart or anything like that, okay? Okay, let's finish epinephrine and then we'll take a, uh, we'll take a break. It's 9.13, okay? Um, hold on for a second. Got some text coming in. Okay. Um, okay. So epinephrine, also called adrenaline, right, um, is a naturally occurring substance in our body. It's our emergency chemical in our body that makes us able to work harder and faster and stuff. So it's secreted by two little glands, two little uh, glands sitting on top of your uh, kidneys called your adrenal glands. And it is the emergency hormone, emergency drug of the sympathetic nervous system, which is the one that speeds everything up and makes everything you know, work harder and faster. So when epinephrine gets into the bloodstream, it causes the heart to beat faster and stronger, to breathe deeper okay, and faster. It causes blood vessels to constrict, to move blood around to more important areas. And it causes your breathing passages, your bronchioles to relax so you could breathe more. Okay, So this is why it's a perfect drug in anaphylaxis 
because in anaphylaxis, we have bronchoconstriction, which makes it harder to breathe. We also have laryngeal constriction up here, and we have bronchoconstriction down lower. But epinephrine takes care of both of those. And in anaphylaxis, there's a vasodilation, which is why it's called uh, anaphylactic shock. It's a form of the distributive shocks where there's vasodilation. And epinephrine causes vasoconstriction. So it basically reverses all the things that are killing people in a anaphylactic reaction, okay? So it relaxes the bronchioles, gets more air in, it constricts the blood pressure, the blood vessels, and raises the blood pressure. So it's a very good drug. The only problem is it puts a huge taxing load on your heart. It really strains your heart. It's like running you know, three miles real fast. So it's a very, you know, uh, trying uh, drug to give someone. Okay, so who do we give it to? Okay, patients that are showing signs and symptoms of an allergic reaction, okay? So what's a sign and symptom of an allergic reaction? That they, they've taken something or have been exposed to something like, you know, bee sting, um, peanuts, milk, whatever, whatever is their thing that causes an allergic reaction, or maybe they don't know they have allergic reactions. You know, but just a good story of somebody having an allergic reaction. Typically, they're complaining of a scratchiness or a tightness in their throat, difficulty breathing. You may see hives or redness on their skin. And we're going to do anaphylaxis. I think it's the next class or the you know, class after that when we come back from break. Um, you know, and I'll show you lots of pictures of what it looks like. Their lips can swell, their eyelids can swell. You know, I'll show you lots and lots of pictures of what it could look like. Okay. Now, besides a patient who has is, is having an allergic reaction, okay, it's a patient who has a history of having allergic reactions and tells you like they've been exposed to something that causes an allergic reaction in them, okay? Um, so I'll give you an example. I was at a Simcha and somebody was sitting at a table with me talking. I wasn't really talking with them, but they were sitting at a table talking to someone else. Somebody else came with fish and sat down next to this guy and started eating fish. The guy didn't notice it, okay? And and the course of sitting there for a few minutes, he started like getting hives and started feeling like, and he turns around and sees the fish. So this guy was deathly allergic to fish and just being next to the person eating fish, he started to have an allergic reaction, okay? So, you know, now obviously if I was that sensitive to fish, I would be a little more careful when I'm at a place that has fish, but not for me to say. And he wound up having to use his, uh, his EpiPen, okay? So those are kind of the situations. Now, we don't need medical direction authorization to use epinephrine anymore. I should take that out because years ago, you know, you needed permission to be able to do it. But because an allergic reaction is considered a life-threatening problem, it's a standing order, which means you're allowed to do it, okay, on your say-so, on your recognition of the fact that somebody is having, um, you know, an allergic reaction. Okay, so... Here's what we work at. If the patient has a prescription for an EpiPen, so they have a, that means they must have a known history of anaphylaxis because they got a prescription for an EpiPen. So if a patient has their own EpiPen, you can assist the patient in administering it, okay? And if the patient doesn't have their EpiPen or it's expired or anything like that, then you can use yours. Now, what I will say to you is that the problem with using a patient's EpiPen is that you don't know if they've kept it in a climate-controlled environment. Um, so I'll tell you when, when they, when you look at the EpiPens, there's an expiration date on them. So obviously if their EpiPen is expired, you should not use it. There's also a clear window on the side of the pen where you could actually see the vial of medication. And if it's cloudy, yellow, discolored or anything like that, you should not use it. So if it's a EpiPen that's within its expiration date and the patient says that, you know, they've kind of kept it with them. They didn't keep a link sitting in their car where it got real hot in the summer and cold in the winter. It's okay to use theirs, okay? Um, but, you know, just have to be careful if the patient says, no, I leave it in the car all the time or something like that, or it's a year expired, okay? So those are, that's for use of EpiPens, okay? Now, if the patient has not been prescribed an EpiPen, oh, so this is actually, this is kind of out of date. I'm, I apologize. So this is what it was what it used to be. So it said it, it said if a patient has not been prescribed an EpiPen, which means they don't have an allergic reaction, it used to have to call medical control, but it doesn't matter anymore. As long as you recognize an allergic reaction, okay, you can go ahead and uh, treat a patient. Now the second dose of epinephrine is a medical control option, which means that you gave the first one, they did not get better, okay, and if you have to give a second dose, you have to call medical control, okay. Now, contraindications. There are no contraindications when you're using epi in an anaphylactic reaction, right? In a life-threatening situation. Because if you don't treat that epinephrine, I mean, so if you don't treat that anaphylaxis, the patient's gonna die. 
So there are no contraindications. What I would say is, you know, I mean, I've never had this, but let's say the guy says, I just got out of the hospital. I had a bad heart attack. I was there for five days. They did, they put two stents in and I was going to my car to leave the hospital and I got stung by a bee and I'm having an allergic reaction. You know, if you can get them to the hospital in the next two or three minutes and, and avoid giving that guy who just had a heart attack, the epinephrine yourself, that might be better than giving somebody who just come out of the hospital with a heart attack and epinephrine. But again, how often does that happen, right? I mean, it's just, you know, worst case scenario. So, you know, even if you had somebody who said to you, you know, I have 10% of my heart left because I had bad heart attacks, you know, if they're not so bad and they could hold off to get to the hospital, I would do it only in people who've had severe, severe damage to their heart because epinephrine is like, you know, the heart going from zero to hundred miles an hour in, in like a couple of seconds. It puts a huge you know, load on the heart. Okay. So what's the problem with giving epinephrine? Everything here is true. It's going to increase their heart rate. It's going to make them scared. It's going to make them excited. It's going to make them feel nauseous. It can give them chest pain and give them a headache. Epinephrine, just like think about when you were really scared and you had epinephrine secreted into your bloodstream and all of a sudden everything's pounding and you're bouncing all over the place. So epinephrine is a great emergency drug in anaphylaxis, but it does have that side effect of putting a real severe strain on your heart. Okay, I don't know who 845-323-7557 is, um, so I don't really want to let them in the lecture unless anybody- I know, knows. I know, it's someone from the class. And oh, it is? Okay. Walter. Walter. Okay, no problem, okay. Um, okay, so now what's the dosage? So it goes by weight. So under 30, under 30 kilograms, I'm uh, sorry, over 30 kilograms or 66 pounds, right? Remember 2.2 pounds is every kilogram. So 2.2 2, 2 times 30 is 66 pounds, okay? You give the adult dose, which is 0.3 milligrams. So the yellow EpiPen says adult on it. That's the adult one, okay? So right now you don't have to worry about it because it has the right amount of drug in it. The pediatric one for patients under 30 kilograms or 66 pounds is the green one. Now the way an auto injector works, and I have plenty of expired ones, so I will bring them to class. But what I would say is you need to be very careful when you practice with them. We have things to inject them in, but be very careful because there's actually, even it's expired, there's epinephrine in there. So you don't want to jab yourself with it. So for an auto injector to work, and please, hopefully everybody's listening. Well, actually, let me backtrack for a second. You see this clear window over here? That's the window I said you could see in to see if there's any problems with the actual medication. So to use an auto injector, this blue cap pulls off. This is a safety that prevents it from working until you pull it off. And then you have to press this orange part firmly against their leg or deltoid muscle. And if you press it firmly, it breaks a little seal and a spring plunges the needle in. You will never see the needle because when you pull it away from their arm, this orange cap covers the needle. It shoots down and covers the needle. Okay, so you will never see the needle. They instruct the patients to use it on their outer thigh because it's easier for a patient to do it but you are permitted to do it in the upper arm because the medication will be absorbed quicker in the upper arm than it will be in the lower leg, okay? You do need to know 0.3 milligrams is the adult. Half of 0.3 is 0.15, right? This is point really point, uh, 0.30 milligrams. They always chop the zero off when they do decimal places. So 0.15 is half of 0.30, right? So it's half the dose. So again, 66 pounds and over adult, 66 pounds or less peds. Okay, any questions on that? Okay, so yes. go ahead. Uh, just another question. The It comes automatically sized that way, I'm assuming, right? Yes, yep. So in other words, the yellow one has the 0.3 milligrams. It's the adult one. It says adult on it on the other side. And the pediatric one has 0.15 milligrams in it. Yep. So the question is, you just give one and that's it. So the kit comes with two. So you give one. And if they're not feeling better within about five minutes, you would have to call medical control and give them a second one. Okay. And for the same thing, I'm assuming it's for the adult. Yeah, adult or kids, same thing. Doesn't matter as far as uh, second dose. It's the same way. Okay. I mean, and, you can put it in the thigh or in the hand, whatever it's closer. Not hand, never hand. Never in the hand? Not the hand, no. Shoulder, 
Sh a shoulder under the thigh. Shoulder or thigh. You can't give epinephrine into any place near fingers or toes because epinephrine constricts the blood vessels. And if you actually accidentally, like if you were to stick this in your finger, it would be a big emergency because you'll constrict the blood vessels and in your fingers, you don't have very big blood vessels and you could shut the blood flow off. So wow. it's the deltoid, okay, up here. And they're gonna show you in class or the outer thigh, okay? Mm -hmm. I'm also gonna show you a different way of doing it, uh, which is where you actually draw it up yourself in a needle and give an injection, okay? So we can't really do that well in pictures, but in class, they'll show you how to do that. Okay, so again, when you're using epinephrine, you wanna make sure their pulse oximetry is better than 94% as best you can. It may not be because they're having an allergic reaction. They're gonna need to be on oxygen. Okay, and this would be one situation where I'd say if you can get them on a non rebreather, I would do that as quick as possible. Their lung sounds probably are gonna be wheezing. Okay, so you see that there's an expiration date on it, right? So it's very easy to see. Okay, this is, this is a different style EpiPen, but this would be the safety. Okay, so again, you pull the safety off, make sure it's not expired, make sure it's not discolored over here. And then you press it up against their leg. You don't need to jab it. You just need to firmly press it up against their leg. Your finger should be nowhere near this orange thing. Where this hole is, is where the drug comes out. The med not the drug, the needle comes out, okay? So again, this is a different one. So she's looking to make sure it's not expired, okay? Pulling the safety off, okay? And pressing it up against, in this case, they're doing the outer thigh. Okay. And then is there, is there any amount of time I need to leave the needle there? Or so I, just... I believe, I believe the, um, the instructions with it, um, says that you should leave it in place. I think it says 10 seconds. Um, it, it pretty much happens instantaneously. It says probably to leave it in place. So to leave it like this for 10 seconds. And then when you pull it away, again, you're not going to see the needle when you pull it away, cause it's going to cap itself, but, uh, to massage the area. In other words, to rub the area where it went in for another 10 seconds. Now over here, I see they're doing it on top of the pants. Yep. Is the needle okay to go on top of clothing? Absolutely. Should... The, the needle is strong enough to go through on an auto injector. It's actually it's strong. It's going into the person and you know what? I don't know what dirt he has on his pants. Oh, listen, clothing. they're having they're having a severe allergic reaction. So don't worry about it. In other words, if they were really dying of anaphylaxis, you're not going to take the time to cut their pants rub their skin with alcohol and give them an injection. You're just gonna do it, okay? Then again, get... the, patient, the patient is not you know, cleaning their leg before they give it themselves. So you don't have to worry about that. Okay, any questions on that? Okay, and then she's documenting everything. Now there's a lot of different types of auto injectors. This is a cheaper version, okay? So there's still the covering. So if you see here, it says one and here's two. So here you have to pull this cap off first, then pull this cap off, and then the same thing, you inject it in a leg. This is just a cheaper version of the other one, but the difference with this one is at the end, a needle will be sticking out, so you have to be careful. Uh, this doesn't self-cap because the company that has the one that self-caps has a patent for another couple of years. Now, this is what we're doing now, okay? Because of the cost of auto injectors, the state allows uh, ambulance cores to actually learn how to draw up the medication in a syringe from a vial and give it injection themselves. It's called check and inject, okay? And check meaning check the dose and inject. So this is the way a lot of people are doing it now. So we're gonna show you both. We're gonna show you using an auto injector and we're gonna show you this. So the auto injector is the quickest, best way to treat a patient. No messing around, one, two, three. This is the cheapest way to treat a patient. That's the difference, okay? Same drug, okay? but this is gonna take you probably three to five minutes. The other one is gonna take you about 30 seconds. So that's you see over here, you have the alcohol. They make you clean yep. it before. So obviously there so, is some concern. So if you, are, if you are giving it in their arm, right? Which is how we give it here. And you have a second to do it, you can, okay? Just like any injection, usually we clean it. But if this is what you have and you don't have an alcohol prep and it's a pants leg and it's gonna, you're not gonna take their pants down to be able to do it, you do not have to clean it. Okay, if you can, you can. Okay, so what happens with check and inject is we're actually gonna teach you to assemble. So you got the syringe, you got the needle, and we're gonna teach you the right way to draw medication out of a vial. It's not as simple as it looks, okay? And to draw up the right amount. Now these syringes are nice that they have two marks on them. I think the next picture shows you. They have the 0.15, which is the pediatric dose, and the 0.3. So you can only 
you can't mess up. There's only two lines to draw up. If you're giving peds, you draw it to here. If you're giving adult, you're drawing it to here. Um, so, but a regular syringe would have 10 markings. They'd have 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3. So they'd have 0 0.1, they wouldn't have 0 0.15. They'd have 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5. So you'd have to know if you're giving the pediatric dose that you have to draw it between the 0 0.1 mark and the 0 0.2 mark. And there is a 0 0.1, 0.5 that you would draw it up at, okay? And again, I'll show you all this. Don't worry about it. I know it's you know a lot to look at pictures and stuff like that. Okay, so we're gonna take a break. Um, any questions on the Narcan? Bef uh, not the Narcan, I'm sorry, on the epinephrine before we- Yeah, uh, what happens if you give a little more? I'm just asking, what could be the consequence? Well, in, what is what did I say it does to your heart? It makes them um, right. go too fast. Right, so if you give more, what's gonna happen? It start rising. The heart, heart is the heart is going to work harder, right? And they said the side effect of it is that it strains your heart. So I mean, giving too much, okay, would put giving too little, it may not work properly. Giving too much will overstrain the heart. So this is actually one where you really need to know, you know, what you're doing and give it, you know, the right the right dosage and stuff like that. So because too little is not going to help them, and too much can hurt them. Again, if it's a choice of dying of an allergic reaction and getting a little too much epi. Obviously getting a little too much epi is the better choice, but um, you know, there's no reason why you can't draw up the right amount. I'll tell you what the, the problem that you're gonna see when you, um, when you draw it up is, as you start drawing it up, right? You see this is filled up with the medication. You're gonna see an air bubble somewhere in here. There's always an air bubble. So you don't actually have the right amount of medication because there's an air bubble. So you have to know how to tap the air bubble right? And push it back out and then draw up more medication. So sometimes people draw it up and they think because they brought the plunger, they have it to the right amount, but they may have a lot of air in it. So they don't actually have the right amount of fluid. So there's a little bit of a skill, you know, in doing it. And uh, the problem with EMT is like, how often do you give epinephrine as an EMT? So, you know, I mean, how often do you give epinephrine as a paramedic? So, I mean, it's, you know, this would be a thing where if you did it once a year, twice a year, it's a lot because people don't typically have severe allergic reactions. So, you know, paramedics practice this extensively, you know, in class. And then also every, at least by us, at least once a year, everybody comes in for a whole day and has to show that they could do every skill they're allowed to do. You know, on a, on a BLS level, yeah. uh, you know, how often do we practice it? I mean, you know, I mean, I know in New Square where I do their training, we tried very hard to practice all the skills twice a year. But, uh, you know, since COVID, you know, nobody's practiced anything because, you know, nobody's been in person. Well, I mean, nobody's supposed to be in person. I don't know what they're doing. I haven't been in the building in quite a while. But, um, you know, um, so that's the problem. You know, I mean, that the, uh, you know, the, your skills, like anything, if you don't do them on a regular basis, the, your your uh, proficiency, your, you know, don't uh, deteriorate. So, you know, it's a, it's a, it's definitely an issue. Okay. So why don't you guys take a little break and then we'll come back and um, we'll start up with Narcan, okay? So it is um, 9.32, come back about 9.45, okay?
extra fat from no the platelets stop the i'm sorry the aspirin stops the platelets from sticking and clogging up the artery right so why why can you take it what covid does is it makes your blood thicker yes so your concern is that if you have the fats and it will and it will be oh, that so two different things you're talking about you're talking about in a heart attack that's what aspirin does is it stops those remember you have platelets floating around your body all the time they get activated to stick together right when your platelets are floating in your blood right now they're not sticking together or else we'd all be dying of clots so what happens is when they sense a injury a wound of something bleeding that's when they change to be able to be stick together so when we give it in a uh, heart attack situation that's when we're giving it to somebody to stop those platelets from sticking together when we're giving it say i don't know prophylactically right just a, a prophylactic means like as a precaution um like to prevent a second heart attack or something like that you're just giving it because having a little bit of aspirin in your body makes it less likely for you to have any kind of problem with blood clots developing or something like that why why is that because it's, it's not a blood thinner no it's not a blood thinner but again clots are caused by platelets okay so if you you're not when you give aspirin you're decreasing the amount of platelets okay that's why it's more likely for somebody to bruise right because the, there's not is the same clotting and you're interfering with the ability for the platelets to stick together in the case there is an emergency it stops the, the it slows down the clotting factors um yes i mean clotting factors are something a little different but yes um i mean i guess that's an okay way of explaining it but again we're we're you know we're we're doing the jewish thing and we're reading way too much into it what we need to know is that and they're not going to ask us anything like this on the state exam what we need to know is that in a heart attack setting since the problem is that a blood clot is developing in that artery caused by the platelets if we give them aspirin we slow down that blood clot and stop it from getting as big and shutting off complete blood flow so the quicker we give it the better the outcome for the patient is that's all we need to know okay frank just one question what does granite drill do what does what do benadryl benadryl is an antihistamine so one of the substances one of the chemicals that's released by your body when you have an allergic reaction is histamine so an antihistamine does not let the histamine work so but it's not the emergency treatment of anaphylaxis it is a treatment not that EMTs can do it but it is a second line treatment but a first line treatment is epinephrine it's the more important of the drugs to give so benadryl doesn't help you to open the airways at this point so what what basically benadryl does is it definitely relieves the skin symptoms the itching and the hives and helps with that it probably helps a little bit with the breathing problem but not quickly and not 100% not like epinephrine mm -hmm. so you're not going to hurt somebody having an allergic reaction to give them benadryl okay but we don't give it as emts like if you had a if you had a, you know i mean you can use antihistamines for a lot of different things right like if you have seasonal allergies a lot of the sprays that you spray up your nose or the zyrtex or the you know all those medicines are antihistamines it's just that benadryl was the first antihistamine and benadryl has a side effect of making you sleepy where a mm -hmm. lot of the newer antihistamines work quicker and don't make you as sleepy so i mean you know it's just again benadryl is just one type of antihistamine and i read about one more item, which is ibuprofen uh, i said it right yeah ibuprofen yeah it's uh, yeah. motrin right that's what it is yeah mm -hmm. motrin advil mm -hmm. oh, that's how they're called okay yeah so that's all it is it's an anti-inflammatory medication that also reduces fever just the same as aspirin same as Tylenol. so you know, okay so we're going to get started in a second somebody wrote on the chat um that it says um i'm just going to mute everybody here we go in the background um somebody wrote that uh, they have some kids um, let me see. Actually, now there's an extra one. So let's see. Can you give baby epinephrine? Can you give a baby epinephrine? What do you mean by yeah. a, a baby, an infant? Uh, yeah, infant, four months. So usually infants um, do not have allergic reactions. I'll just tell you that. It's not so common for an infant to have an allergic reaction because the part of your body that causes an allergic reaction is called your immune system. 
and baby's immune systems are not um, very well developed. It is possible for babies to develop allergies that were passed on from the mother, um, but it's not common. It does happen, but it's not very common. So could you give a baby epinephrine? Yes, but the dose would be a lot less than that 0.15. So, you know, I mean, but it's not so common to give, you have to give epinephrine. And I would not use the, I would wait for the paramedics or take the kid to the hospital at that point because you're, be give, you're gonna be giving a lot less um, epinephrine, you know, than that 0.15. So somebody wrote that they have two kids that have allergic reactions and that their doctor told them not to bother to waste the time to pull the clothes off, which is kind of what I told you. And the box does come with, yes, when you buy epinephrine, it does come with two pens so that if you need the second one, it's there. Okay, so that is true. Um, what else do we have? Frank, I asked you the wrong one. I'm sorry, Zofrin. Oh, Zofrin is a drug that makes you not vomit. Oh, that, so, so when somebody that, has, somebody has, uh, like somebody has a really bad vomiting, we give them Zofrin to calm them down so they stop vomiting. Oh, Zofrin is not instead of uh, of aspirin or no, no two completely different drugs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Uh, um. Yeah, Zofrin is just a drug to stop people from uh, from vomiting. That's all it does. It calms their stomach so they don't vomit. It's actually a great drug. We've only been carrying it for a couple of years now, but it really does help people when they, you know, have problems with that. Okay, so it is time to start. Um, okay. Um, okay, so now we're going to talk about naloxone or Narcan. So again, one's a generic name, one's a trade name, same thing, Narcan. So that is, that is used to treat a patient who's suffering from an overdose of opioids. Opioids are medications used to relieve pain, and they are the most abused uh, medications out there. Okay. So there are a lot of, um, you know, overdoses of them. Okay. Now there are opioids that have no medical purpose like heroin. Okay. That are just highly addictive medications. And then there are opioids that have a medical use to relieve pain, right? Like Percocet and Oxycontin and Codeine. And um, I don't know. I mean, I can't remember all the names and there's so many of them. The Vicodin, you know, so there's lots of different ones. The problem is that Opioids relax the brain, relax the signals in the brain in the central nervous system. And what happens when somebody has too much of an opioid on board is they become sedated and their breathing gets very slow to the point that they stop breathing and die. Okay. So there is an antidote. It's been around for about 25 years called naloxone or Narcan that when administered blocks the opioid from working on the brain. The issue with it is that it only lasts about 30 minutes, and usually the opioid will last longer than 30 minutes. So if you're in a situation where you have a transport, you know, you're further than 30 minutes from the hospital, you may make the patient better only to have them get worse again. And if that's the case, you would just give them more Narcan. Okay, and more, again, Narcan naloxone used interchangeably. Now, years ago, Narcan could only be given by paramedics because it had to be given as an injection. Now, they realized that naloxone will work well sprayed up the nose so that EMTs are now allowed to use it. And actually there is a company that just came out with an auto injector of Narcan. So that will probably be again, an additional way of giving Narcan um, in certain situations. Because again, if the nose is clogged, whether it be mucus or blood or trauma, Narcan up the nose is not gonna work. So having an ability to give it as an injection will definitely be a, an advantage, okay? So the State Department of Health. Okay. You mentioned a whole bunch of names of different, uh, the, the, it's, I guess it's the same um, main drug, but it's called differently, right? Right. So there's many. They all have the same effect? Yes. The symptoms are all the same? Yes. And in fact, if one of you texts me uh, tomorrow, I will try to see if there's something on the internet of a list of the most commonly abused or commonly used opioids that we could, I could send you. And it's all names you're going to probably have heard before. You know, like I said, Percocet and Vyadan. You know, when you get your teeth, you know, you get Percocet, uh, Vyadan, um, Codeine, you know. Tylenol, Oxycodone, no? Oxycontin, Oxycodone, Oxy. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's a million different versions. Hydrocodone, you know, there's a million fentanyl. There's a million different drugs um, out there. 
um, you know, that, that are all opioids, but they all do the same thing. Okay, so, you know, probably about four years ago, the state allowed, started allowing EMTs to use naloxone, okay? And it's an intranasal administration right up the nose, okay? And when they say truly needless, it's because, you know, back then EMTs were not trained to give epinephrine by injection, so they didn't know how to give injections. So therefore, there was no way for them to be able to give the Narcan. But now that it's intranasally, you know, they're allowed to give it. And even technically, they should be allowed to be able to draw up Narcan and also give it by injection if there was some problem with the nose. But it's so rare, um, you know, uh, it's it's so rare that you have people who have problems with their nose. Somebody just sent, will epinephrine work better if you give it to the right arm? You mean right versus left? So no difference uh, in arms if it's right or left. No, no, uh, no difference. Same, same blood vessels, whether it's your right arm or left arm. You know, no, no difference in absorption or anything like that. It wouldn't really matter. It will be better in your arm than your leg because your arm is above your diaphragm, closer to your chest, closer to your heart. So it would definitely work faster in your arm. Again, patients give themselves epinephrine in their leg because remember they're they're scared, they're having trouble breathing. It's much quicker and easier for them to inject it in their um, leg than it would be their arm. Okay. Okay. So, what's the advantage of nasal medications? So, ne not going to be asked on the test or anything like that. But obviously, it's so much easier to spray something up someone's nose, okay, than um, you know, than give an injection, right? It's safer for you. You don't have to handle needles or anything like that. It's quick, you know really no training, right? The public is allowed to use Narcan. So there's, you know, it's pretty simple, uh, quick, easy way to give it, okay? So now what's the problems with it? If there's any problem with the nose, it may not be absorbed, right? If there's too blood up there, mucus up there, trauma up there, or if they took medications that constrict the blood vessels in the nose, like cocaine, Afrin, and stuff like that. So maybe they just didn't abuse an opioid. They also abuse cocaine, right? Completely different class of medications, okay? It may be, you know, that it's so constricted the blood vessels from the cocaine or people that abuse drugs that they inhale up their nose. If they do it for a long period of time, they actually destroy the blood vessels in the nose. They actually destroy the whole nose, the bone and everything. If you see people who, you know, uh, abuse drugs for a long period of time, they actually don't have a nose. The whole thing just deteriorates and, and, and you know, falls off, so to speak. Okay, but I've not seen that, right? I mean, most people who abuse opioids die way before they're gonna cause long-term damage to their nose, right? I mean, the average length span of an opioid abuser is probably two years before they kill themselves. So now remember, Narcan does not treat the addiction, right? They're still gonna be addicted. We save them the next day, they're still gonna be addicted to the drug. In other words, their brain craves the drug. It's not like they can really control what they're doing. Once they get on these drugs, the brain craves it so bad, they'll do anything to get it. It's very hard to get clean from these drugs. That's the danger. You know, That's why really, if your doctor prescribes you an opioid for pain and you're strong enough to tolerate the pain, I wouldn't even start taking them. They say it takes about seven days to get addicted to opioids. So I wouldn't even tempt it, you know, although it's next to impossible to get a prescription for opioids now. I mean, doctors, the, the federal government, the Drug Enforcement Agency, the DEA monitors every prescription of opioids. So doctors are very hesitant um, to prescribe them. So it's pretty hard to get, you know, if you get it, you get like one pill, you know, when you get your teeth extracted, they'll give you maybe one or two pills to get you through the first, you know, couple hours. And that's basically, then they tell you to switch to, you know, um, Motrin or something like that. Okay, so to be able to turn it into a mist, if we're not using that commercial device that I'll show you in a second, you know, where it's all packaged in one quick, easy way to give it, you have to draw the medication up in a syringe and there's gonna be a needle that's gonna help you draw it out of the vial. Then you take the needle off and you put this device called an atomizer. And what it does is it basically, as the fluid goes through it, it turns it into a fine mist because if you just spray water up the nose, it'll just flow right back out. So it turns into a fine mist so it can be absorbed by the blood vessels. This is actually foam, this white part. And that, you know, you could stick it up the nose without any pain and it kind of seals the nose, okay? So again, we don't usually use this way anymore. That was the older way of doing it, okay? Now dosing is two milligrams. So you used to spray half up one nostril and then take it out and put it in the other nostril and spray the other half up. And the dose for kids is one milligram. So you used to spray half of a, milligram or milliliter up one nostril and the other. 
But if you have that four milligram commercially prepared device, it doesn't matter. They allow you to use it on both. So the only time you had to worry about the dosing was when you were actually drawing it up yourself. Okay, and again, like I said, we don't really use it that, that too much. So again, up the nose. Now the aiming is a little bit of an importance. When you aim it, if you're going in the right nostril, you actually want to angle the syringe so it's pointing towards the top of your right ear. And if you're going in the left nostril, you want to aim it so it's going to the top of the left ear. So you're spraying it really back up in here, right, or over here, not bouncing it off the septal wall, the wall that divides the right and left nostril. And it's absorbed better that way. So opioids, we said, are central nervous system depressants, right? So it just, your brain is, your central nervous system is made up of your brain and your spinal cord. So when they are administered in too high of quantities, they cause a decrease in mental status up to including unconsciousness and a decrease in breathing up to and including not breathing, right? Becoming apneic, okay? And usually the death is caused from respiratory arrest, not breathing, okay? And the hypoxia then leads to the cardiac arrest. Naloxone or, op or Narcan basically goes to the part of the brain that likes the opioid and blocks the opioid from being able to get there. So it stops the opioid from having that effect on the brain of making them unconscious and stop breathing. The problem is that Narcan only lasts, okay, like I said, about 30 minutes. So now what are the three classic signs and symptoms they will ask you? Okay, so this is guaranteed to be a question. You have to know the signs and symptoms of an opioid overdose. So they will have a decreased mental status up to including unconsciousness. Their pupils will become pinpoint. What does that mean? What does pinpoint pupils mean? It means that they, the black part of your eye becomes like a dot instead of big, right? If you looked at your eyes right now, you have big pupils, especially if you're in a darkened environment. Pupils are the lens, right? Or the, 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 the thing that opens and closes the, that regulates the amount of light. So if you're in a dark environment, it opens up more to let more uh, uh, light into your eye, okay? So your pinpoints will come very tight, very small, okay? And the breathing will become slow, not deep, shallow, the tidal volume will drop and it may even stop. And the other two classic things that you'll see but these are the three main things they would ask you. The other two classic things is you'll see snoring respirations, right? Because anytime a patient becomes unconscious, their tongue partially obstructs their airway, okay? And a lot of times their skin will get cool, pale, and diaphoretic if they're in this condition for a while, just like when somebody's in shock. So again, on the test, they're going to say the three main signs of an opioid overdose, unconscious, pinpoint pupils, slow to absent breathing, okay? Okay, so again, we said that Narcan reverses the effects of the opioid. Heroin is just one of them. Morphine's another one. Oxycontin. Why would they go into uh, shock? Why would they're not, why would they're not going? Them? They're not going into shock. No, well, why would I see those uh, symptoms? Does the heart also stop going? No. Nope. Uh, well, the heart will stop because if a patient's not breathing, there will not be enough oxygen. Okay, um, going to the heart, and then obviously all the cells will die. Right, just like you know, anytime there's not enough oxygen going. So, um, yeah. Isn't that basically like someone has a, a head trauma, like a brain injury? So you see, all the 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 heart rate goes down because it doesn't it doesn't uh, get the message to beat. That's so different. And a, and a head injury, the heart bradycardia is caused by a different reason, which is pressure pressing on the vagus nerve. So it's a completely different reason. Here, the heart will eventually slow down because it's just, it's just not getting enough of the fuel right, the, the, the gas that it needs to beat. So it's a completely different reason. Okay, so somebody wrote, can this be used on all overdoses? No, we said multiple times, right, that it can only be used on opioid overdoses. So in other words, somebody overdosed on a benzodiazepine like Valium, this would be of no use. Somebody overdosed on an amphetamine, you know, that makes their go faster, everything go faster, it won't be of any use, only on opioids. Opio opiate is singular, opioids are multi multiples of it, right? Okay, so again, Narcan typically weighs off at 30, 30, about 30 minutes, to be honest with you. And then the patient is going to deteriorate. So if you had a patient, let's say, I don't know, you were in the mountains and you were then, you know, coming back to, uh, I don't know, you're going to a different hospital. You basically have about, um, you know, 30 minutes before you're going to start seeing the patient getting worse again. Okay. How do you differentiate if it's the opioid, if it's opioid? Again, signs and symptoms, right? We said decreased mental status, pinpoint pupils, slow absent breathing. Now, the nice thing is, I think where you're getting at is what happens if you give it to a patient who doesn't need it, right? So Narcan will have no effect on a patient who does not need it, okay? So you don't have to fear, 
like let's say you gave it to uh you know you gave it to somebody sleeping somebody sleeping and snoring you can't wake them up and you give them narcan because you're not sure so nothing will happen okay it only works to block opioids so if there's no opioids nothing's going to happen it doesn't work on anything else so you don't have to worry about hurting someone or anything like that with it isn't the signs and symptoms the same as an alcohol overdose uh, i mean i don't know how heavy you drink but why would your pupils get pinpoint with uh with alcohol I mean, yes, you could be tired, you could be sleepy, you could be unconscious. Um, does alcohol stop someone from breathing? Maybe only if they're so drunk that they vomit and aspirate it, but it doesn't typically stop someone from breathing. It may make them snore because they're so sedated, but you know, alcohol typically kills people by killing the liver. So when somebody has a you know Purim time, like acute alcohol intoxication, they either die of one of two things. They die because they vomit and choke on their vomitus and aspirate their vomitus or long-term, you know, I mean, if it's not treated, like let's say they went into a room and fell asleep and nobody took care of them, you know, it could, it could especially in somebody who has liver problems, it could, um, um, it could damage their liver permanently, right? I mean, because your liver is just an organ that cleans your blood and it has a hard time processing all the alcohol, okay? Um, Okay, so somebody just asked me, can an unconscious patient have open eyes? Um, that's a good question. I've seen people dead with open eyes. Um, so I don't know. I mean, the, the response of the body is always to close the eyes because it doesn't want the eyes to dry out, the, you know, the, the, the fluid on the eyes to dry out. I'd have to look that up if somebody could be unconscious with open eyes. I mean, I guess I would say yes. I would think it could happen, um, you know. I saw it, so... Yeah, I mean, I guess yes, I, thought... I guess it could happen. I'll, I'll try to do some research on it. Frank, okay. just a question. You're talking about narcotics. That's what I'm asking because I've seen it. People, unfortunately, today, they are on narcotics, let's say heroin or whatever, those stuff. Can you use it on that as well? So narcotic is actually not a term. Believe it or not, it's a legal term. It's not actually a medical term. So we use it, narcotics, the same as opioids. Uh, but in the law, there's a lot of other drugs under the narcotics laws that are not opioids. But uh, you can use Narcan on any opioid, and I'll get you a list, okay? But you will see the term narcotic used, but narcotic is more of a legal term, not a medical term. So the mm -hmm. class of medication medically is called opioids. Mm -hmm. Okay, so before we had that fancy one shot up the nose deal, this is what we basically had to do. We had a box, and in the box, there was a vial of Narcan. And it would screw into this, and we would stick this on the end of it and push it and spray it up their nose. So what happens with this is you had to take this red cap off. You took this yellow cap off. This would screw up about an inch or so into here, okay? Not all the way. Then you would pop this yellow cap off. This would screw on the end. You could see like it screws right over here, okay? And then you stick it in their nose, right? This would be up in their nose, and you would depress this and be pushing it up into here, and it would spray the medication. Now this had two milligrams and two mLs. So you were supposed to give half of it or one milligram up one nostril, pull it out and give the other one. This is the way we used to kind of do it. So I kind of had all the instructions here. So you pulled the caps off, right? The yellow cap was here. The red cap was here. You put it together. You took the uh, other yellow cap, this one off of here, you screwed this on and then you were ready to go. You see, it doesn't screw all the way up. The most common mistake people made was they assumed that this had to screw all the way up into here and they kept on turning it because it twists in. So they kept on turning it and it would actually break it, but it only comes in about an inch or so. Okay, and then you would be pushing this. This would be up in their nose. You would be pushing this as it's up their nose. It would spray the medication in. Okay, so we'll, we'll definitely review all this stuff and everything like that. Okay, so what do we do for a patient who we believe has an opiate overdose? Okay, if you don't have Narcan naloxone available, or if it's going to take you a few minutes to be able to give it, so then you want to start bagging them, right? That's support respiration. Start bagging with the bag valve mask. Okay, make sure that you're certain it's an opioid, okay? Because remember, there's other things that can cause unconsciousness. Hypoglycemia is the term for low blood sugar, and low sugar blood sugar can also cause unconsciousness, but low blood sugar will not cause pinpoint pupils. Um, low blood sugar will not cause somebody to breathe slowly, right? So this is how we start putting our patient assessment stuff together. And you start, you know, again, this is going to be, you know, a few months out for you guys. And if you're not working, it's going to never happen, right? If you don't actually get out there and take patients, it's never going to happen. 
Okay, so then once we're sure it's an opioid overdose, then we're going to give Narcan. And we said that it's a total dose of two milligrams. We give half up one nostril and half the other. Now, what do you want to do? Do you want to give it to them to the point where they wake up? Or do you want to give it to them to the point where you just get their breathing to a normal level? So usually we say we just want to get it to the point where they're breathing enough times a minute to stay alive. And enough times a minute to stay alive is like 10 to 12 breaths per minute, you know, roughly. Um, and the reason why is that if you were to suddenly give somebody a lot of Narcan who was overdosed on an opioid, you would go the other way with them, where instead of being unconscious now, you would completely wake them up and they'd still be craving the opioid and they could become upset, they could vomit, they can even be violent. So we don't usually reverse them. When we say reverse, we don't usually bring them back to complete consciousness. We just give them enough of the Narcan to breathe adequately so that they will stay alive, okay? Years ago, we used to say, you know, we don't wanna leave them in an unconscious state because if they vomit, you know, they could always choke on it. But if they start vomiting, you could always give them a little more Narcan very quickly and you'll just wake them up. But remember, if you're gonna wake them up, they can be a little bit of a handful, right? They can be a little bit difficult to manage because you're basically throwing them into what they call withdrawal. Withdrawal means that, you know, they're craving the drug and they don't have the drug. So I'll just tell you, you know, I've given Narcan a few times and not one patient has ever said, thank you for saving my life, right? All they ever say is like, oh, what'd you do that for? You know, I feel horrible. I feel like I have a headache. I feel lousy. So, you know, these are not, you know, people in high standings to start with most of the time. And you've, you've basically stole their high from them and, you know, they don't feel good about it. Okay. Now this is the main way we give Narcan nowadays. So this is packaged one shot up the nose. You can't control how much you're giving. There is four milligrams of the drug in here, but they do say the patient really only absorbs two milligrams. In all honesty, I think they absorb four milligrams, but who cares, right? You're not going to hurt them if they're, you know, unconscious, not breathing by giving them the whole thing. This is what we do. One shot right up the nose, doesn't matter what nostril. And if they don't wake up within a couple of minutes, we actually give them another one in the other nostril. So you don't have to really fear about, you know, giving them too much. The reason they say that there's four milligrams, but only two is absorbed is that it's this whole amount of fluid is 0.1 ml. So it means it's about the drop, like a drop of water, like a tiny little drop of water. So they're saying because there's so little, there's, you, they can't actually absorb the whole four milligrams. The reason why they make it so little fluid is that if you put too much fluid up the nose too fast, the nose, the nostrils, the blood vessels can't absorb it and it just flows back out. Remember when you're sticking this up their nose, it does go up their nose. You want it to act like a little bit like a cork in a wine bottle for a second and you spray it up, let it sit there for a second. And a lot of times they'll actually start stirring and moving almost immediately. Like as soon as you spray it up there, they will start responding almost immediately. Okay. I always stand back after I give it to them so that if they, you know, if they get a little crazy, you're not right in front of them when, you know, when they're getting a little crazy. Okay. So any questions on the Narcan? So what you need to know is what the signs and symptoms of an opioid overdose, which is decreased mental status up to and including unconsciousness, pinpoint pupils, and slow to absent breathing, right? And we said that if we're using this one, we give the whole thing up one nostril, we wait a couple of minutes. If they don't respond, we give another dose, another whole one up the other nostril. If we're using the other one, right, this one, where this has two milligrams in it, right? So we're gonna give one milligram in one nostril for an adult and another milligram in the other nostril. And if it's pediatrics, we're gonna give half a milligram. So, and if it's pediatrics, you actually have four doses in here. So you're gonna give a quarter of it in one nostril, another quarter of it in the other, and then you have the other half of it ready in case you have to give it again. Okay, any questions on the opioids? Uh, yeah, why are you having saliva <laughs> come out of the mouth uh, when you overdose? What did you say? Saliva? Why are you having saliva coming out of the mouth? Yeah. Just like when you're sleeping, sometimes you'll notice your, your pillow is, uh, is wet. Just You're just drooling. That's all. Usually if they're on their back, you won't actually see it um, come out of their mouth too, too much. I saw it last week on the street. They were laying were back. They have, were they having a seizure or were they actually having an No, opioid? he was overdosed. We went to PMS. He was, right. he was like, I could, like, so we saw, saw the eyes and we saw everything, but he was had a lot of saliva coming out of the face, of the mouth. You should have videotaped and took pictures. We could have used it for teaching. 
Oh. Um, <laughs> it's fun to see. <laughs> um, oh, actually, I mean, again, I don't know how many of you go to, you, you know, have YouTube, but I mean, you can go to YouTube and see videos of almost anything. You know, there I mean, are places talk. that you could see it every day. Oh, I know. I know. I was, uh, I went up to visit my son at the college in Binghamton and uh, he took me, you know, for a tour of the city and we we're, we were walking around where his, uh, his apartment is going to be next year. And it was like a war zone. I was like, you're not going to live here. And he's like, no, we, they have a parking lot connected to the building. So we never have to walk around. I'm like, we're walking around now, you know? So, uh, it was, uh, it was pretty interesting, but yeah, there were people like unconscious on the sidewalk. I was like, oh my God. So, uh, but yeah, no, you could, it's amazing what you could see. Well, and listen, you know, you can go into certain parts of Spring Valley, Havistra, you know, and see the same thing. Even Pearl River, there's some bad parts of Pearl River, you know, a lot of overdoses. Okay, so let's finish up because I'm getting tired. I'm sure you are. So, so oral glucose. So what basically this is, is sugar, okay, in a concentrated form. And we use it obviously to treat somebody who's having a diabetic emergency where their sugar is low. So we don't know enough about diabetes yet because we didn't do that class, but there's two diabetic emergencies. There's high blood sugar and low blood sugar. And in a low blood sugar emergency, the brain is not getting enough sugar, okay, to be able to stay awake and work. So if the patient is not deeply unconscious, we can give them some sugar to swallow, to eat, okay, to wake up. I mean, obviously a glass of orange juice would do the same thing. This is just much more concentrated amount of sugar, right? Some of these have, if you look here, this has 25 grams of sugar. So this would be about the equivalent of probably eating about 10 candy bars, right? This one has uh, 15 grams of sugar, okay? So you always have to read to see what the dosage is. Um, so, you know, those are just quick ways of raising the blood sugar in somebody who is having a low blood sugar problem but is not yet unconscious. If they're unconscious, unfortunately, there's nothing you do on an EMT level but put them in the recovery position maybe put them on a little nasal oxygen and transport them, you know, on an ALS level, we'll try to start an IV and give them sugar in the vein to wake them up. Um, there is another drug that you can give as an injection, but EMTs are not allowed to use it. It's very expensive. It's like $350 each dose, but that's when I was saying there may be other drugs coming down the road that EMT is going to be able to allow to use. I think that's probably, even though it's $350, I think they can make it optional and say, if you want to buy it, you could buy it, you know, each individual ambulance core. Um, but, that's, you know, if you have a place way upstate New York and there's no paramedics and it's just a basic life support ambulance and they got a 30, 40 minute ride to the hospital, I think that would be kind of a life-saving, you know, intervention in those kinds of patients. Okay. Doesn't so, sugar absorb under the tongue? Sugar absorbs any place. Really, we absorb our sugar in the stomach. So, you know, I mean, you can- so why, you can, can, why can't I put some sugar under the tongue and let- Because let it's, it like... it's still in the mouth and there's still a chance they could choke on it. So the rule is we don't put anything in their mouth if they're unconscious, because we're afraid that they could choke on it. That's the basic rule. So again, when we're giving oral sugar, we're basically trying to raise the level of sugar in the bloodstream, okay? To hopefully have insulin to get it into the cells. Okay, so a patient who has a mild altered methyl status, has a known history of diabetes, Okay, who can swallow without any risk of choking, right? That's the big thing. So we can't give in somebody who's deeply unconscious and able to swallow, and nobody has allergies to sugar, obviously, but there may be um, preservatives in the different preparations they could be allergic to, but since they're unconscious, you're not going to know that, okay? So really, it's anybody who's unresponsive and able to swallow. Uh, side effect, okay, they sometimes patients do feel a little nauseous with it and stuff like that. Uh, but the biggest side effect I ever experienced was I gave somebody who was, you know, he was awake, but he was a little, you know, a little out of it. Um, I gave him oral glucose and he started screaming and holding his head like, oh, and I'm like, oh, my God, I, I think I misdiagnosed this one. And after like a minute, I was like, what's wrong? You know, talk to me. And after like a minute, he said my tooth. So obviously what happened was he must have had a cavity or a crack cavity or something. Your cracks filling. And when that sugar hit the cavity, he was screaming in pain. And we've all experienced that, right? We got a little whatever, ate a piece of chocolate and it went in somewhere. So this is probably like 50 bars of chocolate and he just had excruciating, excruciating pain. So that I think is the probably the most common side effect I've had where people complain of a little bit about, you know, pain in their teeth. Um, obviously, if a patient who is unconscious, it can be you know, when they say no gag reflex, they mean an unconscious patient. Your gag reflex is your protective reflex to stop you from choking. It can be aspirated into the lungs. Remember, aspiration is the term for getting something into the lungs other than air. So it could be food, it could be vomitus, it could be anything. Okay. 
Um, sorry. Okay, so there's all different ways it's packaged. It's just a manufacturing thing. Okay, so this one is 15 grams. It could say glucose 15, glucose 20, glucose 25, whatever it is. So there's all different. Typically in adults, we give 25 grams to start with. Um, but you know, you can give it slowly and as they start waking up, it would be better if you wake them up enough that they could actually eat a real meal because this is just fake sugar, right? This is just like candy. And the body reads this is a different way than it would read like a, a good healthy, you know, breakfast type of thing. So, you know, I always try to get them awake enough where they could actually eat and then give them some real food to eat. Okay. Um, years ago, we used to put it on a tongue depressor and kind of stick it in their mouth and let them absorb it slowly. But now the state doesn't want us to put anything in their mouth if they're unconscious. Okay. So again, the patient has to be awake, can swallow, and can protect his airway. Okay, so any questions on that one? Okay, so now we're going to talk about a medication that we don't actually carry on the ambulance, but that we may be able to use. Okay, this is nitroglycerin. We said is prescribed to a patient who has angina pectoris. Okay, that situation where they can develop chest pain when they exert themselves, and that this relieves the chest pain by dilating the arteries in the heart to get more blood, the coronary arteries to get more blood to the heart tissue, and more blood means more oxygen. More oxygen means less lactic acid, and therefore the pain will be relieved. So we don't actually carry this on the ambulance, okay? But a patient may have it, and if it's their nitro and they're having chest pain, we can help them in taking it. It's carried two different ways. It's carried as tablets that quickly dissolve under the tongue. It's one tablet that you would give, okay? Or a spray. These are the two most common sprays, okay? And the sprays, like I said, are close to $500 somewhere between $350 and $500. These are pennies. So again, depending on the insurance you have, you may be getting these versus these. Okay, we said that we know the nitro is working on the patient. They'll feel a tingling uh, sensation, a burning sensation, mild burning sensation under a tongue, and they'll get a slight headache. The burning sensation or tingling is more common with the tablets, not so common with the sprays, but either way, they'll get the headache, depending on what they're taking. So again, the generic name is nitroglycerin. Trade name, the company sell it under, it could be many, many different things. The most common one is nitrostat, okay? It's also uh, sold as a paste. They go on the patient's skin. EMTs don't use it that way. What it does, its action is it relaxes or dilates the blood vessels, okay? Specifically, we want the coronary arteries to relax because it will get more blood to the heart, make it easier for the heart to work, okay? So an EMT can assist a patient in taking their nitroglycerin if all of the following criteria are met. In other words, all these things have to be a yes. Patient has signs and symptoms of chest discomfort that you think is a heart problem, specifically either an angina or a heart attack, right? Patient has a, a prescription from a doctor for sublingual tablets or spray of nitroglycerin, okay? And there's no contraindications. So now we're going to talk about the contraindications, okay? Medications not prescribed to the patient. So if it's not the patient's medication, they can't take it. Patient's taken three doses already and the pain's not been relieved. The patient has to have a systolic blood pressure above 120, right? And they should not have taken any disrectile, erectile dysfunction medications like Biatra, Cialis, Levitra in the last 72 hours. Now, when they take nitroglycerin, this is what's gonna happen, okay? Their blood pressure is gonna drop a little bit. Because their blood pressure drops a little bit, they get a headache. Because their blood pressure drops a little bit, they get tachycardic, okay? Sometimes they'll feel like their heart's pounding a little bit. Very rarely, they will get bradycardic. That's very rare, okay? They can faint if their blood pressure goes too low, right? So the most common thing is they get a headache and they feel a little dizzy with nitroglycerin. The dosage we said is one tablet or one spray under the tongue. That's called sublingual. And they're allowed to repeat it at five-minute intervals up to, up to three doses. So they take one. If the, blood, if the pain doesn't go away, they take another one and another one. If we are giving it to them, we need to recheck the blood pressure in between each doses and make sure that the systolic blood pressure stays above 120, okay? So again, patient no relief from the first dose. We give them a second one after we make sure their blood pressure is above 120, and we could do it up to three times, so a total of um, three doses. You mean by 120, if we start by what number? It needs to be way higher than 120 in order that we should, we should be able to give them the nitroglycerin? No. no, the systolic has to be above 120. In other words... You know, somebody has a blood yeah, but pressure. It's going to go down. It's going to start going down. Oh, uh, it depends. What happens? Feels the pain. What happens if the blood pressure was 180? It's not going to go down. Okay. So it has to be now, above one. Just has to be now above you say that it becomes it becomes uh, tachycardia. Um, doesn't the heart start working harder now? Yes, but it's rare. I mean, like I said, the the most common side effect 
of nitroglycerin is a mild headache. That is absolutely the most common side effect that you will see in somebody who gets nitroglycerin. Now, what we do to, to minimize that chance of it is make sure that they're sitting up on the stretcher with their legs up before you give it to them, and then it's less likely for them to have it, okay? So again, we wanna recheck the vitals in between each dose, okay? And we wanna reassess what it's done to the pain. So remember when you had the, the um, classification of the pain, right? The uh, OPQRST, the S was severity on a scale of one to 10, with 10 being the worst. So before you gave them nitro, you asked them how bad's the pain. So maybe they say a seven, give them the first dose of nitro and the guy's like, oh, the pain's down to a two. Okay, well, you wanna hear the pain gone completely. So if it's only down to a two, you can recheck his blood pressure. And as long as the systolic is above 120, you can give them a second dose. Okay, so again, they're checking blood pressure, making sure the medication's not expired. Okay, if it's a tablet, you drop it under their tongue. If it's a spray, you just spray it under their tongue. Make sure you spray it under their tongue, right? It's gotta go between their tongue and their lower part right in here, not on their tongue, right? It's gotta go under their tongue, sublingual under their tongue, okay? So this is one, right? So there's two different types of spray, the, the white bottle and this one. It may even be more, I've just never seen them. Okay, so that's nitroglycerin. And he said the indication is somebody who's having chest discomfort, okay? Who has a prescription for nitroglycerin, which means they've been previously diagnosed with angina, so if they have pain that's brought on by exertion and starts to get better when they stop the exertion, it's probably angina. If they have pain that was brought on by rest, okay, or, or exertion, but doesn't get better with rest, it's probably a heart attack, right? Because in other words, the pain of a heart attack will not go away until you open the artery. The pain of angina will go away as soon as you stop doing, not, not completely away, will be get better, start to get better as soon as you stop doing what brought the pain on. So if you were walking up a flight of stairs and got pain from angina, okay, as soon as you stop walking up the stairs, the pain will start getting better because this is pain brought on not by a complete blockage of the artery, but by the fact that you're exerting yourself, you're working too hard. Okay, so the last thing we're gonna talk about, and we don't have to get crazy about it, okay, but after September 11th, right, they were very concerned that there was gonna be what they call a nerve gas attack. Since then, the Russians have used it to kill quite a few people, okay? We've, you know, England, they did it, and, and uh, Russia, you know, they keep on poisoning people. They call it Novichuk. Um, it's VX, basically, is a nerve gas agent. A nerve gas agent is a weaponized uh, pesticide used to kill bugs. It's basically, they, they took the chemical formula of chemicals to kill bugs, and they made them work so much better that they were very, very effective in killing people, okay? And you know, we don't see it here in America being used as like that type of thing, because typically the Russians don't kill people in America. They like to do it across the ocean. Um, but it is possible, especially for you go, you guys live in Orange County, it is possible if there's still places there's farms to see people overdosed on pesticides, right? When they're using different types of pesticides and insecticides on, um, you know, the, the crops, the, the things they're growing and stuff like that. Now, what happens is the there's the way nerves work, right, is that a nerve does not go from point A in your body to point B directly. There's gaps in the nerves and there's chemicals that carry the signal from the wire where it stops to the next wire, okay? And what happens when you have a nerve gas agent is it interferes with those signals being, um, you know, carried across, okay? Not, again, this is not something we really need to know on the test, but I'm just giving you the theory. So, when you, when you see somebody, and I'm gonna go over the signs and symptoms, when you see somebody who has a nerve gas overdose, okay, we're actually administering what's called an antidote, right? So Narcan was actually an antagonist, which blocks the actions of it on an opioid. This is an antidote, which kind of reverses it. It kind of like gets rid of the poison and doesn't, you know, stops it from doing things. So it's just, you know, words, but they, they kind of work a different way. Like when you give somebody Narcan, the opioid's still in their body. It's just that the, the Narcan doesn't let it work on the brain. It blocks it from getting to the brain. This actually gets rid of the, the poison, okay? So there's different signs and symptoms of a nerve gas agent, okay? And there's an acronym to remember them, uh, a, a series of letters that are remember them, I'll tell you in a second. But the mildest symptoms, okay, is that basically any place fluid could leak from the body, it starts to leak from the body. So they start to tear, which means, you know, they look like they're crying. Their nose starts to run, okay? Then they start to drool. So you see mild, mild is they start to cry, their nose starts to run. Moderate meaning more severe, they start to drool, means saliva coming out of their mouth. They start to sweat. Again, this is all liquids leaving their body. Nausea and vomiting, liquids leaving their body. 
abdominal cramps, and then they have diarrhea, it comes out their butt, right? Then they start getting to more severe ones. They have their, their bronchial start to constrict, so they feel like tightness in their chest, okay? Muscles start to twitch like they're having a seizure, okay? Their pupils become pinpoint, okay? And then you start having trouble breathing again because of the bronchoconstriction. And then we get to the severe ones. They have changes in their mental status. They start having seizures. They stop breathing. Okay. And they, then they become unconscious and they die. Now I'm going to tell you how you remember this. Have you ever taken the spray for the bees and the wasps and the bugs, right? And there's a bee flying around the sukkah or the back porch or whatever, and you spray the bee and you hit it with a stream coming out, right? The stream of the chemical in the can. What happens is the bee falls to the ground, it shakes and has a seizure, and it dies. That's exactly what, because again, all a nerve gas agent is, it's a stronger pesticide. That's exactly what happens to a human when they're exposed to a nerve gas agent. They will have a seizure and die if it's a strong enough concentration. If it's a mild concentration, they'll have all those leaking of the fluids from the body. So somebody invented this mnemonic to remember the different signs and symptoms. So it's sludge them. So the S is salivation, which means you drool. The L is lacrimation, which means your pupils, okay? I'm not your pupils, your eyes, you cry. The U is urination, right? So you know what that is. Defecation means you go to the bathroom. The G is gastrointestinal upset, means your stomach bothers you, right? So you have the diarrhea and the cramping. E, emesis is the medical term for vomiting. Meiosis is that your pupils constrict. And the M could also be muscle spasm, like you have a seizure. So that's one acronym. Um, I have not seen this on an EMT exam where they ask you to say, you know, what's the L of sludgeum? A paramedic exam, yeah. Um, but I, there was a question a few years back where it said you had a patient who was farming and suddenly became unresponsive and was drooling and uh, sweating excessively. What should you suspect? And the answer on the test was nerve gas. So, you know, um, it, I haven't seen it in a few years. That was right after September 11th, you know, and now we're not as concerned about it. The, the, the government actually gave these kits out. These are auto injectors that have the drugs to reverse it. Gave these kits out to multiples, you know, tons of these kits to every ambulance um, in the state. And uh, they all expired and they never replaced them because they're hundreds and hundreds of dollars. So, you know, we don't actually have any treatment for it right now in the hospital they do, but in the field we don't have it because all of our kits are expired. So this is another acronym, one was sludgeum, the other one is dumbbells, same basic things. Okay, just a different way of remembering it, diarrhea, urination, meiosis, pupils are constrict, bradycardia, bronchospasm, emesis, tearing, tired, drooling, seizures, right? Just more, you know, signs and symptoms. The sludgeum is the more common one. Okay, dumbbells is another one. Now, the two drugs that we use as antidotes are atropine sulfate and pralidoxine chloride. They're packaged together in that kit I just showed you, right? This one over here. That's called a Mark I kit. I have no idea why it's called a Mark I kit. I think it's just a marketing thing. And what's interesting, like what I like about this kit is that there's auto injectors just like the epinephrine was. But when you pull them out, I don't know if you could see they're in a holder and it says one and two. This is the first one you give. This is the atropine. When you pull it out of the holder, the safety cap actually stays in there. So it's ready to be given as soon as you pull it out of the holder. So you give the first one, okay, you wait a minute or two, and then you give the second one. And, uh, you know, that's the basic treatment, you know, for the patient. Uh, hold on a second. Okay. Okay, so again, an antidote is something that neutralizes a poison. So in this case, we actually neutralize the, the substance, right? I explained to just blocking it and stuff like that. Again, it's not going to be on a test. So it's called the Mark I kit. Okay, so there's two different auto injectors, one for the atropine, one for the pralidoxine. Um, out of the two of them, the atropine is the more important drug, but they're you know both, both important in the treatment. But if you only had one or the other, the atropine would be the more important one. There's a actual other one that came out where it has both of the medications, okay, inside of the same syringe, so that, you know, you don't have to give two separate injections, but it's the same two medications either way. Okay, and then what it does is it basically reverses some of the effects of the nerve poisoning. So it's, it basically raises their heart rate, relaxes their bronchioles, dries up all the secretions, the tearing and the drooling and everything like that, calms down the stomach, and reopens the pupils. 
okay? There is no contraindication if you truly know they have a nerve gas agent overdose, okay? And there are some side effects, you know, I mean, and stuff like that. Like the biggest issue is that, I don't know if you've ever gone for um, a vision test where they put drops in your eyes and they give you sunglasses when you go outside to put on. So anytime you give somebody atropine, it dilates their pupils. I remember we said your pupils control the amount of light. So if they're dilated, they're real big. So there are people that have a lot of pain after they have atropine, especially atropine drops, and they go outside in bright light, they can actually injure their eyes. So if you had an unconscious patient, and you gave them atropine, you'd want to make sure their eyes are um, dry. Now, it's not uncommon to have to give them multiple doses. So how you know you've given them enough treatment is that the secretions, the drooling and the tearing and all that stuff actually starts to dry up. So that's how you know that you've given them enough of the medications. So um, what could I say? I mean, again, I would not think you would ever, ever, ever have the opportunity to use this because if you were to walk in, you know, into a nerve gas area without a complete spacesuit on, you would be unconscious and have the same effects the patient's having. So even though we had this, it's not like you really probably would ever get the opportunity to use it unless you completely had, you know, a hazmat, level one hazmat suit on. So it's more of a knowledge point than an actual practical thing, because again, if you were exposed to the nerve gas agent, you would have the same signs and symptoms immediately that the patient has. That's how quick they work, okay? So again, we had the atropine, we had the pralidoxine. So this is what the protocol said, okay? So you can give, okay, both of them, if all of the following criteria are met, Okay, signs and symptoms consistent with a nerve gas agent. And obviously, if you had it, you could treat yourself. There's no contraindications. Okay, you may need to use up to three doses. So three kits. So that'll be six injections, two, uh, three of each one. Okay, so I wouldn't get into that, you know, worry about that too, too much. One, because really we don't have it anymore. And two, that in real life, if you were to go into a nerve gas environment, you would be dead and you wouldn't be able to treat the patient. So let's do a quick review. So we said that aspirin in the heart attack patient, oral glucose in the diabetic patient, and oxygen in the hypoxic patient, we carry on the ambulance, and we talked about different reasons to use them. Um, and inhalation medications like oxygen and albuterol, okay, in the asthmatic patient, nitroglycerin in the chest pain patient, and epinephrine, okay, in the anaphylactic patient or medications. The only one there, obviously, is the nitroglycerin we don't actually carry. So that would be a situation where a patient had a history of angina pectoris and was given a prescription for nitroglycerin by their doctor and they're having chest pain. And for some reason, they didn't take their nitroglycerin and we're gonna help them take it. Okay, we said intranasal Narcan and opioid overdose. So in that situation, we said there were gonna be three classic signs, unconsciousness, okay, or at least a severe altered mental status up to including unconsciousness, pinpoint pupils and slow to absent breathing, okay. Um, most of the medications we talked about tonight are all standing order. The only time we needed to call medical control would be as if we're using epinephrine, not on the anaphylactic because then it's standing order, but on the asthma patient who has become unconscious and cannot use the albuterol. Then we would have to call for medical control. They're not gonna ask you about epinephrine in an asthmatic on the state exam because that's a regional use and the state exam is written for the entire state. So I don't think they would ever ask you that on a, um, a state exam, but they will ask you about narc, uh, I'm sorry, they will ask you about epi for anaphylaxis. That's definite. Okay, again, we have signs and symptoms, right? Samples, signs and symptoms, allergies, medications, past medical history, last meal and events leading up to it as a way of helping us to uh, know the medications. And you could actually kind of figure out a lot about what's wrong with a patient by seeing the medications they take in the house. The problem is you have to be able to know what all those medications are, and there's too many for you just to remember with your brain. So there are apps on the phone. There are little pocket guides to them that you could purchase and stuff like that where they would tell you this medication is used for high blood pressure. This medication is used for diabetes. Because sometimes you'll say to patients, why are you taking these medications? And they'll say to you, because the doctor told me to. And then you'll say, well, what history do you have? I don't know. So if you could see the medications they're on, you could kind of say to them, well, you know, this one's for high blood pressure. The doctor ever say you have high blood pressure? Yes. This one's for diabetes. Oh yeah, I have diabetes. So, you know, and it kind of helps you to get the, uh, the idea of what's wrong with the patient. Again, we need to know indications, contraindications, and side effects of all medications, right? So indication is why we use it. Contraindication is when we wouldn't use it and side effects are possible problems that the patient can have when we give them the medications. 
Okay, we talked about the five rights, right? Right patient, right time, right medication, right dose, you know, right documentation, okay? And then we wanna, when we give medications, we wanna reassess and documentation should include the reasons why we're giving it, how much we gave, how we gave it, okay? The patient's responses to the medications and any vital signs and vital sign changes. Okay, I'm not gonna ask any questions because it's, what, what 10.30 now? And I'm sure everybody has lots of questions. Um, I gave you out the um, medication sheets that I wrote up as kind of quick reference guides. I think they are a quick, you know, review of all the different medications and how we use them and everything like that. Um, so we will definitely have a review class on all this stuff. I just don't know when everybody wants to review because I got various different texts from people about, you know, Matzah Shabbos this week because it's uh, Hanukkah. Um, my wife's not crazy about me doing it anyway, this Matzah Shabbos. So I'm thinking probably one day next week to try to squeeze one in. I just have to see what my other teaching schedule is. So I will send out a, you know, invite for one day next week and we can go over everything and anything that everybody wants to. But you have to have things that you want me to go over. You can't just tell me everything because we're not going to have enough time to go over everything and you know, the short time there's in class. I mean, I'm sorry, we've been in class for a long time. And in the short time we have for review classes, okay? So does anybody have any questions real quick? Um, with the nerve gas, mm -hmm. doesn't, uh, won't uh, the patient um, have irregular heartbeat? Because... Um, usually, usually they don't have an irregular. Irregular means the time between each beats is different. Usually what it is is that they will have either a very slow one if they're hypoxic. So usually first on they have a fast one. And then as they get hypoxic, because the heart's got not getting enough oxygen, they slow down. But if, if it uh, interferes with the, the nerve gap, doesn't mm -hmm. the, the SA node give out? The no, it doesn't interfere. Good question. Good question. But it doesn't interfere with it in the heart. The heart is one continuous run of wires. The heart, remember I heart told you the heart's kind of different. It works every place. by itself. Yes, so it doesn't, exactly, uh, exactly. Uh, I understood, wow. Yep. That's why it screws up with the breathing, but not the heart, okay? Uh -huh. So it doesn't really screw up with the heart too much. The heart, if it's gonna screw up, it's because of the hypoxia, but that's a good thought, okay? Okay, anything Thank else? You. Now, Asher, I know you said you had a question you wanted to ask me. I mean, um, I've just been so busy, I haven't been able to take your call. Do you wanna ask me now or do you wanna do it privately? Um, uh, it's basically, I, I wanted to know if I could set up, um, first I want to get the, the online book. So yeah. Could... Somebody else asked me too. I, I have it. I got the, I worked it out with the publisher. I just keep on forgetting to do it. Um, and I'll just tell you right now, um, it's just so busy with COVID. I don't really have a second to myself, but just keep on feel, just text me and say, you know, book, 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 and I'll, uh, I'll try okay. to. Then my next, my next question is probably answered. Okay. I was thinking if you have time for any private sessions or anything. To... <laughs> uh, I don't, I mean, it's not that I would say it's a waste of time, but if, if I'm going to meet with you, I'd rather meet with everyone. This way, you know, everybody's questions we can answer. Because if I start individually <laughs> yeah, meeting with everybody. I don't want every... to get everybody upset. You know, no, no, I'm saying. Questions. No, no, no. It's basically what, what's happening is I'm going through the tests. Like uh, there's some apps that have tests to get ready for the, for the exam. Mm -hmm. And some questions are basically i answer the question and i get it wrong and i think that the the, the answer that i that i answer should really